Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes so we know when to start the flipping <laughs> show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, you have an Alexa in your hotel room. No, I definitely don't. I mean, hopefully we trolled some people at home who actually have those, but... Welcome, welcome to episode 130. We're joined by Mimi, Bala, and Sliggy. We're taking time out of your sleeping schedule because anytime you're not co-streaming, I assume you need to get those 40 winks. Yeah, pretty much. This uh, two hours that I could use, but, you know, I thought I'd be nice to you guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate Very it. Very kind. Um, we, we've also got Mel coming on the show later on to talk Game Changers and VCT America, so we're going to have two double special guests and also, you can stick around to try and see how we change the guests because the whole show might break. That's what Kurt told us. So that might be a cute little surprise for you about an hour down the road. Um, so we're going to be covering EMEA. We're going to be covering VCT and a little bit of the Game Changers stuff as well. We're not going to be covering Pacific because unlike Sliggy, we have required sleep. But I might throw a couple questions your way, Sliggy, in terms of like comparing team to team. But uh, if you're a Pacific fan... Unlucky. Unlucky. It <laughs> really is unlucky. <laughs> um, the first thing to talk about, though, before we get started, Brennan Wyatt, not, not on the show, uh, because they got in a car accident immediately as soon as they came to LA. So that's been, I mean, they're being just a, a status check for anyone who's wondering. Uh, we're looking after them. Brennan's doing perfectly fine. He's been on the broadcast as well. He's just got some big bruises all down his knees. And Wyatt is in a bit worse shape. But uh, he is being looked after, and he will be fine, kind of, eventually, once he's had a process of recovery. Um, but yeah, like he said, he got concussed, and he's got whiplash, so he's, he's not doing the greatest. But he's, uh, he's got people around him making sure that he's doing all right. So he'll, uh, he'll still be there in a metaphorical sense for his weekly award at the end of the show, which, you know, that's, that's what everyone looks forward to at all times. Of course. All right, let's talk EMEA. Sliggy, I want to pick your brains here. All Fnatic. Right. Fnatic. Yeah. Wait, best that's, team that's, still? That's, that's my cue? Yeah, of course, they're the best team. Um, they, just look, they just look great. Like they're not, the thing is, they're not even changing that much up, and they're still winning really well. Like they're, they're kind of playing exactly the same as they were at lock-in. They don't have to change anything up, which means that they probably have stuff saved that they're going to be able to fall back on in the later stages. So... Yeah, it looks um, it looks very chilled out from them. Just, just real basic, good Valorant, like pretty much the the best we've ever seen in my opinion in terms of like fundamentals. So, yeah, it's looking good. Um, it, I'm excited to see what happens in playoffs. Like if they decide to bring stuff out then, or if they're literally just waiting until the actual lands. But yeah, everything's everything's it, the same as we saw in Lockin. We had a conversation a while or like maybe two weeks ago when they were still playing with Kamek about like. Oh, they're not really bringing in new stuff. I was criticizing them for that. And then Josh, you made the point of like, oh, well, they don't need to. And they're always going to have this cycle of whatever that they innovate. And that scares the living. Almost did it. Almost did it. <laughs> <laughs> it scares me so bad because, yeah, they're not, they're not doing anything new. They're Haven exactly the same. They're Lotus exactly the same. Like, oh, actually, Lotus was a little different with the Odin spam stuff, but, um, yeah, I mean, they really aren't changing anything. So you know, down the line, they're going to even get better, which is they're going to go Frieza Form 4 or whatever. Like, it's it's really scary. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's also just a testament to how good they are because just their, their, their coordination between the players and, like, the individual quality of all of them is just so good that they can do the same thing. Obviously, teams are looking at them, trying to beat them. They're the team that everyone kind of has to aspire to if you're in EMEA, uh, but it has not mattered because they're just that much better than everyone else that they've managed to play in the region thus far that they have the flexibility to be able to basically just kind of chill out play the same style and uh, continue to have that work for them uh, i don't know it, it doesn't feel like anyone can contest them maybe navi can but they've continued to do quite a bit of trolling throughout emea and that's also the last group stage match that Fnatic has so they don't even have like even the one team point. you would maybe consider a challenge until the very end and even then that's probably not a game that even matters for playoffs yeah, they're they, just in such a good position anyway. to hide stuff yeah i mean the the team liquid versus Fnatic game i do want to chat for a second about the navi trolling but the team liquid Fnatic game first i saw a lot of people online being very excited for this game because it's been uh, El Clasico of the EMEA, you know, all of these back and forth games to five maps, all, right. all sorts of stuff. But I was 
I was a bit confused about that because to me, there is a massive gulf still between these two teams. I, I couldn't get excited the, like everybody else was. I know, was but the, like... the fans were so bought into it. And I was like, <laughs> God bless you. I think you're going to be very let down by this game. <laughs> I was I was kind of looking forward to it. I, I was hoping because I feel like I still didn't know where to put liquid. Like there was still a side of me that was just like, well, maybe this will be the week where like it will click and look good. Right. Um, yeah, it didn't happen, of course. But I still felt like they hadn't. I, I was still hard to get a gauge with them. Obviously, they played K Corp, and I, you can't gauge any team that plays K Corp really in terms of where they stand. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's. I was holding out a bit of hope. I didn't like the map choices. I didn't really like how they approached. Uh, Lotus, so yeah, it's a little bit disappointing to be honest. Do you think it really matters for a team like Liquid though? Like to me, if you're a, a team in their position, I'm not putting in hours and hours of specific prep against Fnatic. I'm just focusing on improving our game to go up against some of the more beatable opponents later on. Um, maybe, yeah. I, I think there's a few approaches, right? You can either just focus on yourself and just accept that you're most likely not going to win it. Um, I don't know. I would like to. I've got a different. I would like to always beat anyone, no matter like who they are. So I would have liked to have seen a closer game or, or have a, had a better approach. I felt like because they weren't changing so much up, they they actually had a chance, especially over Lotus. Right. I saw uh, like that. Then I still don't think the Lotus comp is good. I I still think it's very fanatics. Uh, fanatics. Yeah. I, I I don't like the fade. I think the fade needs to be a sky. I think the no flashes. I think if you're playing a double controller against this comp, you should be. You should be winning, to to be honest with you. And I know I've seen. I think it was Anders who used to be the analyst, just like tweeting about it online. But I just think everyone's giving them uh, an easier ride than they should have on this map, in my personal opinion. And then you're talking about their opponents being Navi towards the end. I mean, Navi's main trolling has been on Lotus. I mean, I, I don't think that it's even trolling at this point. It's so much as they just want it in the map pool so that they can fix it against the worst teams. But when I watched the Navi Heretics game. It was like a totally different team when they played on the other two maps and then they come out to Lotus and it's like, it's a different Na'Vi. I mean, look at the scores, 13-3, 13-2, and then they drop Lotus in the middle. And it's the same thing that has been happening repeatedly for Na'Vi. They just can't figure this out. Yeah, I, I mean, just every time, like it feels like no matter if they're like making changes or trying to adapt on their Lotus, it's like they can't figure out how they want to play this defensive side at all like they've had a couple different ideas but none of them have been successful and like credit to heretics i think they played a, a solid attacking side in that game but uh, overall i think honestly for navi i agree with you that i think their idea is just that they want to play this map against the lower tier teams and try and improve it but i wouldn't hate to see them just kind of move that to be the the map they're getting rid of i think they've been Mostly banning Icebox, if I remember correctly. But I feel like at this point, maybe you just get rid of Lotus. It's not clicking for you. The rest of their map pool, this after they kind of stopped playing as much with like the Gecko in the first uh, the first week, have looked really incredible. As you saw from the rest of the series where they were just stomping. Yeah, I mean, they still played Gecko and Pearl, if I remember correctly. I, 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 I don't know. This doesn't feel like the same pattern of Navi that we've seen in the past, like the old FPX and stuff like that. It, it feels... Well, actually, it feels more like the old FPX than last year's Navi, where the experimentation was like a little less goofy. And I, I don't know, there was always the Yoru stuff, but that was very specific maps and not like a full fledged, like, let's play Gecko on every map. Let's not know how to, like, how to even adapt to a comp here where you don't want to be playing Jet for whatever reason and put your Jet on Omen. I don't know. It's like, it's, it, feels weird and it scares me because it's not changing in a positive way like cnet is not comfortable on, or on omen you could tell that watching this game watching the prior game watching any of the games he's just not comfortable and he's not able to make the same amount of plays as he does with jet so like why are you trying to force it and so at least when i'm looking at it i'm like I can, I can, they're just playing the long game, right? They're, they're literally just, they have, it's like the opposite to how Fnatic are approaching it, right? They have comps that I imagine they feel super comfortable on. And instead of just showing them off and giving everyone loads of data and then changing later on into the more risky stuff, they're trying to order the risky stuff now. They're trying to make it so when you go up against them, they're like, oh, they might be using this comp or this comp or this comp. So the coaches just have like loads and loads of data to go off the, like, froze them off. So I think, yeah, most of the time when you're seeing them kind of like as you guys are calling it a troll and they're doing it in like the fast second game, knowing they can 
they have like two maps where they can come back so i'm not too worried i think they're trying stuff out i think i'm always a fan of that i think it's fine um and i think they have like the good stuff that they can fall back on so yeah i think i still think they're they're like a good contender to be honest i think um like you said we probably won't see the fanatic uh, against them actually be like a proper thing until maybe the playoffs um but i still have them as like a good contender for like winning tokyo they're three yeah. and one at the moment Sorry, <clears throat> they're three and one at the moment, along with a couple of other teams. One of those other teams that's really been impressing me is Foot. Um, do we think that this is a legit team? And have they got the chances of being able to qualify, you know, top four, make something happen in Tokyo? I, I mean, I think for sure they have a chance to qualify for Tokyo. I'm still looking at the depth of this team and not being crazy impressed with, like, the the strap book like all the way down the line like the calling in hectic situations i think they rely a lot on pop-off moments and that's really good and i think it'll make them to tokyo but i don't i don't see them as a threat there i see them almost as a lock to tokyo though given how everybody else is playing especially like now that koi has dropped out of contention really like you know, based on the way that they're playing obviously they still have a chance but like the way that they're playing is not impressive not inspiring at all team liquid still struggling like there's not really any more contenders to that spot they've hopped up and almost been a, become a lock for me they, they, i mean they do have three really difficult games coming up though they've got giants navi and Fnatic still left to play which if they won their games against carmen corp and bbl which are very likely to would put them at five and four which i mean that's going to get them to playoffs but it does make their record less impressive than it is currently no because i mean a lot of people are looking at foot as being like yeah like the like the topic title says, one of the most surprising teams of 2023, kind of coming out of nowhere based on what we'd seen in the off season. Um, but if they end up more towards the middle of the pack, does that temper people's reaction to it? I, I would consider this team like right now, like the top of the middle of the pack of EMEA. I think like you, you look at this team, uh, like this region, it's like, okay, obviously we have Fnatic at the top. We have Navi probably second. And then like you get like Vitality, Giants, Foot, kind of liquid that tier. And I feel like there's a lot of potential for those teams to take wins off each other, go back and forth and kind of like find that like craziness in the middle. And for me, well, Foot hasn't been, I, I agree with you. I don't think that they've like been like stunning in their game plans or in their in their calling consistently. What they do have is a team that's fairly well coordinated, that has some players who have some incredible pop-off moments. I, I think them like switching to keeping uh, at a captain in like the main roster consistently has been a good move, supposing that they keep that up because he's been playing insane, even if like that ascent like raised jet comp was kind of cap but it also worked to win in the in the match that they brought it through so who am i to judge too much about it um like I, I think that this is a team who will be middle of the back who will be able to get into playoffs but i think they're good enough to play up and and find upsets at times over the teams that are above them and i think that will be enough to get them to tokyo in in a region that has four slots available to them will they be like a top level competitor at that event against international composite competition i don't think so but I don't think that should be the expectation for them. I think they've already broken expectations. I think most people thought True. that they would be like kind of bottom of the pack. They, you'd have like teams like like Liquid, like Giants playing like lights out above the level of this team. But they've been able to compete with pretty much everyone else. And even if they're losing to the teams they have left in their schedule, like Fnatic, I think they still have Navi left to play as well. That's perfectly fine for me. I think like just like this team proving they can be like in the upper third of EMEA is like enough for this season to already break expectations. Yeah, I think that's, I think kind of nailed it with that because again, I agree with both of you. Like, I don't think they're going to, they're going to go to Tokyo and be any, like anywhere near the favorites, but I don't think that that should ever be a thing for them anyway. They should just be happy that they got there, get the experience and just kind of, sometimes you just be, got to be happy with the progress that you made. Um, I liked their ascent comp, to be honest. I think it's a one and done. I don't think we're ever going to see it again, but I like that they're adding that stuff in. Like, it's always a good sign when you see teams that are actually thinking ahead and actually are bringing in comps to, again, make it harder for coaches and IGLs to predict what's going to happen. So um, I thought that the kind of double duelist had uh, had some cool stuff for it. I liked it. Um, I think it's a very good meta for them at the moment in terms of Atta Captain and um, Mr. Fallon in terms of double controllers a lot of the time as well. I think it's a great yeah, meta yeah. for them. So, yeah, I think, they're, I think they're looking good. In terms of the most surprising team in 2023, I can't think of another team. Like, maybe, maybe last week we would have been saying some other people, but um, I, I think some of the results from this week, I think we just have to, well, last week we just have to 
yeah. say that in my mind, like they are, they are the most surprising, especially with how bad they looked at the beginning of well, the end of last year. Like they did not, I did not yeah, have yeah. high hopes for them at all. Yeah, well, well, I, I think you... as well. Oh, go, go ahead, Josh. Sorry. No, no. Uh, I was just going to say that, yeah. uh, like, I, I think like the direct comparison for me that I have with this team is like their place in um, in EMEA feels very similar to like the place that we've seen from like MIBR in uh, Americas, where it's okay. like a team that had very low expectations going in that took a few wins that people considered an upset and were showing like some consistent, like solid ideas. And then also just like really good, like individuals and clutching the late round. Like that feels like a very direct comparison with me. But <laughs> I think the level of <laughs> competition in EMEA with the other mid-tier teams has elevated this squad uh, above the level that I have expectations for that squad. Yeah, I don't know. I think MIBR is slightly different in the in the sense that they like they looked really bad at at lock-in. Mm -hmm. You know, so like I compare them. Who else? I uh, actually I don't know. A lot of the teams who were surprising kind of fell off like after lock-in, like Talon, like Secret, like they they're kind of not being as good anymore. So. I think, yeah, the answer is yes, but I don't know about the direct comparison to MMBR. I think it's fine, though, yeah. All right, what about that specific game against Koi? Because, I mean, Koi came out of the gates looking kind of spectacular. Shados, Starzo going crazy week one. They get the win over Na'Vi. And it has just been uh, just like a fallen over house of cards since then. It's poor performances alternating between different people on the team. You know, very bad week from Wolfen, a couple of bad weeks from Starzo. Uh, the team looks a little little more lost than I think they did at both lock-in and the beginning in terms of having those, like, good game plans. What What's going on over here? I don't I don't even know where to put them. I have um, pretty much them and maybe Heretics just seem like just that... that, that those kind of teams that if they win the pistol and they get a little bit of momentum going, they can look pretty good. But then if, when it when stuff isn't going their way, they just look uh, they look like a completely different team. And they don't look in like they don't look consistent. So yeah, them them and heretics are kind of like similar in my books of just like they have to have a good start. Um, otherwise, it, it can be like a really bad game for them. They rely on a lot of individuals popping off and actually just turning up because. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see too much consistency with their gameplay. It's a little bit worrying. It's fa it's completely shifted since like the first. I mean, obviously the first week where they beat Navi, even the second week against Vitality, like it feels so drastically different. In the sense, not, not, not like when you watch, like when you're when you're comparing like the amount of set plays that they're going for back then to now, it's like so different. Um, you're you're looking at a bunch of miscommunication rounds. Like uh, there was one round specifically on a set where Cold Mental like doesn't get the calm that Shados died and the alarm bot's down and he's just like sitting there and gets backstabbed by QE and it's like a lot of that stuff happening over and over you're not seeing Cold Dementa being able to sink his flashes from Omen like significantly anymore and you're just missing all of that and when you when you call it a house of cards Josh I think that is very like apt because I see this team getting worse week after week it like, does getting, feel like that doesn't it yeah, and I I don't know. Last time I was speculating something else was going on, but like I don't I don't know, man. Like it it doesn't feel like this team is finding the chemistry that they that they need. Obviously, I'm just speculating wildly, but there's there's nothing to me that indicates that um, people are able to have moments where they're ready, where they're where they're um, consistently happy with the way that they're all playing, with the calls that are being made, all that sort of thing. Yeah, I wonder if there's a bit of a breakdown happening there. I, we, we, you've reminded me of a moment in the... I mean, this is just a mad tangent, to be honest, but it reminded me of a moment in the uh, Giants BBL game that I was watching this week where they showed a clip of the... Um, they showed a clip of the comms and Rhyme is screaming at people to get into sight on Icebox because they were <laughs> kind of struggling against BBL on Icebox. And so he's saying, you know, next time you need to get into sight, you need to get into sight and help me. And Cloud just goes, shut up! This <laughs> 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 was so, so good. I mean, yeah. the, the comms cut off straight after that, so I guess there's a chance that we misinterpreted it. because of. <laughs> but it just sounds like he was telling Rhyme to shut up. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I could. I, I, it makes me think. The reason that I thought about that is because I was thinking about the, the hearing, um, hearing Starzo and hearing um, oh, Zeke on comms oh, yes. back when that old Ascend. Ascend team was playing oh. and oh just screaming at each other. 
and wondering like if that kind of thing could potentially be you know <laughs> happening on this koi squad as well in terms yeah. of i mean just a, a that, that's evolution. the sort of thing that's the sort of thing that i'm i'm thinking of because i don't know that's uh, yeah anyways i also think that cole Menta is like has been i don't know in a in a sense where he has like a lot of young players that he's bringing up and this team is more established people who have been star players who like it's it's harder for somebody like Cole Dementa to handle all of that, especially when you're not like when you're not delivering in the frag sense a lot of times. That becomes hard as an IGL when they can point at you for, you know, you missed up, you messed that situation up, you your aim is off, whatever, you're not fragging. And then on top of that, then you start to doubt their calls. That's the sort of thing that I think of in this team with the dynamic that they have. Mm. I mean, just speculation, but yeah. Well, <laughs> is your timer off? <laughs> yeah, I, I, it it is actually. The yeah. Alexa's just started bing bonging, <laughs> and uh, I think that means it's time to go to the next one. Uh, there was another great clash of the French teams. So oh. Vitality played Calming Court this week, and I didn't write this title. I want to be very clear. This <laughs> this one is all Kurt. This one is all Kurt. Who would win five sideshows of Calming Court? I can tell you, it would definitely be Calming Court. I'm I'm hard stuck. How ascended. close do you think the game would be? It depends. Are you be scream close? sized or are they Josh sized or you know? Oh right, like five scream sized sideshows. <laughs> it doesn't make it too much of a difference. I don't think there is a large size difference between me and Scream. Um, yeah, I don't even want to mold about Carmen Corp anymore because it's just sad. Yep, yep, yep. yep. I scream just needs to. Uh, if there's if there's one way they can get out of this, if there's, I, I mean, obviously they would have more ways, but to me, it's just the answer is scream, stop by gelling, give it to anybody on this team, please. You look so unconfident, like so unconfident going into these games, playing the duelist. Which is good, by the way. Good, good change. I think it's gonna work out better. But like, he's not gonna stick to it. He tweeted that the duelist didn't make a difference, and that's not why they're losing. Oh no, <laughs> he did. He literally tweeted that, and then there's a tweet yeah. afterwards saying we just need, or maybe it was the same tweet saying we just need to play like we do in scrims. And I'm like, oh come on, man. I don't know. Come I on. kind of read you play that with too. Max Money in scrims. I can tell, bro. You know, you see economy. I almost read that tweet from Scream and like interpret it more as like. Guys, what else do you want from me? I did what you want. I played Duelist. It still didn't work. Like, it just felt like a continuation of, like, despair. Like, uh, the tweets from him, the, the tweets from their coach PM, like, everything I'm seeing from this team, it feels like they're just, like, mentally crumbling. Uh, yeah. I, I think, like, one of the, the coach's tweets was something like the fact that, like, we haven't found a solution yet. We have to find a solution. There has to be one. Just, like, struggling to, like, grasp on how to fix this team at all. Like, it it just feels like the team is beyond salvation and it's it's yeah like you guys said it's past I, the point of being funny it's just like it, i feel it bad is at this point. it's so sad it feels like punching a toddler when i'm like co-streaming them because i, I the, the thing is too i remember saying on plat chat after locking that i thought they were high key trolling the way that they were playing was awful but the mistakes were quite fixable and if they did fix those mistakes i thought that they would have a decent chance of making top six or maybe even top four in emea which is mad, perhaps, especially considering that Liquid improved and, you know, that wasn't really factored in, that kind of stuff. But but really, they have just gone down and down and down. And I think at this point, the confidence is missing so much. I mean, you look at how Scream and Nuzera especially are playing, and it's unbelievable how lacking they are in confidence compared to what you, what we've seen in the past from Scream playing Duelist and what we've seen... I mean, actually, Nuzera's kind of always looked like that with playing on this team, but... Like the moment Destrian teleports up onto heaven <laughs> and Nuzera just lets him get the spike, lets him challenge, well, doesn't let him get the spike, but lets him get the TP off without challenging him and then dies taking the 1v1 afterwards. And it's like th those kind of moments where they're just not grabbing hold of timings at all. It's sad to watch. It really is. Yeah, it is. I mean, Destrian had probably the best game I've ever seen him have, to be fair. It's probably the best I've seen him look. But if I just look at K Corp, it's like, uh, it's like they're, it's, 
<laughs> it's like they view the game as like a square, but the game's actually a cube, and they're only seeing literally just one side of it, and they and they just can't they just can't figure out that actually they can't use the same thing week after week. They have to have better game plans, and like so so they basically when they played BBL, the only reason they won that game, in my opinion, is because there were no demos out there of them, because they sure. did the exact same thing against uh, Heretics, exact same thing against like a uh, liquid just using the same thing again and again and then just going well why is this not working and it does <laughs> it does ring true of a lot of things that i experienced when i was in liquid i'm not going to go into it too much um but it definitely rings true of a lot of stuff that i experienced from that in terms of being like we w we have to change stuff up we have like we it is easy to anti-strat how we play in my opinion it is very one-dimensional um and i think yeah we're just seeing that kind of rain true i think the I like the jet, but the, the you know, it's like what you're saying. The confidence is gone. Like I'm, I'm looking at him. I'm looking at Scream taking angels, where I feel like I would get the kills faster than him. And I'm just like, <laughs> I, and, and and literally, I, like never in practice, I ever thought that once. No, like, there's I no to, way, I to, right? I used to like go and practice player. and be like. Yeah, I used to go and practice and be like, this guy is the best I've ever watched. He's the best. He can out aim everyone. And I'm watching this official, and I'm seeing him whiffing shots, and I'm just like. I I would hit that. Like I'm I would hit that. Like what? Who is this player? Like you take the name tag off, I would say it's someone else. And yeah. I think half of that has got to be confidence, but half of that's also got to be his brain just going with the stress of trying to IGL a team that doesn't have anything set and doesn't have, or if they do have things set, they don't get them to the finish line. They're set for like the first 20 seconds and then it's just, woohoo, let's yeah. see what happens after that. And I it's mean, so, I mean, they're, they're just set up so poorly. You can tell, I mean, how hard it is. <sighs> for him to be calling because of how often you see them change setups at the last second on defense. Like so often they don't have their Viper wall down for like two yeah. seconds left and Nevera just throws it randomly because they haven't made the call on how they, how they want to use it. I mean, maybe that's also up to Nevera, but like you could tell how hard it is for them to understand what's about to be called. So like, that's what I'm saying. Like just, you, you, Scream is actually a great leader. Like he has great leadership qualities in terms of like emotional leadership. I think when it comes to actually leading and calling strats, that is where it falls falls to pieces, and that is where you start to get a lack of confidence. Because unfortunately, the, the reality is he's probably listening to all the critics and pundits and podcasts out there. Like this is a moment that you, you expect him to get that right click every yeah, exactly. single time, and so. Yeah, he's listening to all that, and he's realizing, okay, I'm not doing a great job IGLing, but he doesn't see any solution. And I think the solution is cut your losses, start giving it to somebody else, give it to Nevera, I don't care, give it to XMS, XMS has calling experience in the past, give it to one of the two new guys, it doesn't really matter. As long as you get a new set of eyes on how to adjust your, how to actually get a nice playbook going, something like that. Maybe the other person will be able to do something, but you could still be there as an emotional leader that this team is looking towards to have their confidence come from. Because when you're lacking confidence as a leader, then all of a sudden the rest of your players are not going to be confident either. And it's screamed, yeah. so yeah. I, I agree with all of that. I think maybe yeah, you said something there that made me realize that maybe maybe this is all my fault because when he was IG, <laughs> when he was <laughs> when he was IGLing in Liquid, like I I was when like obviously you want to get everyone's confidence up, so I'm just like going like a deal like great calling on all that stuff, and maybe that's maybe that's gone too far in his head <laughs> because honestly his shot calling is has always been good. I think his shot calling on on the fly is good, but yes. A lot of the outside of server preparation is often why I would say that he wasn't a, 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 like an actual IGL in terms of that stuff. He was like more of like what you're saying, like a leader, yeah. whereas um, all of the IGL stuff um, was always like a void in this team that I tried to, f to fill to the best of my ability. Right. So I think, uh, yeah, I think what you said is kind of kind of spot on. But, but yeah, I'll, t I'll, I'll take the fall for it. It's my fault. I think as well. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <Good. right. Very laughs> kind. I think as well like that that to me sounds exactly like what I'm thinking of where he, he is he's actually good at mid-round calling too but when For you sure. put him in this situation where he's trying to actually execute strats that they've worked on and mid-round at the same time that adds an element that is really difficult to handle I, I also just want to point out too that this is not all on Scream's IGLing. Like, if Scream calls a con of, like, let's say they're playing Split, which they've played a ton of, and they've got, like, seven rounds total in three games that they've played or something. Let's say he's calling. All right, it's a slow round. They've taken some AM and control. Let's go back to B, guys. Like, pivot B. 
the players on Common Core are so timid and poor at being able to create space for themselves to go on and execute, uh, go on a rotation like that. They're always very slow, very cautious about how they move around the map. They don't properly understand how to get space off their utility. I mean, I'm watching these players like beefing walls constantly, beefing smokes, beefing flashes. Like, it's not just that you know it's not like scream well, should be a master puppeteer telling them exactly <laughs> where all their utility should go there's a, some expected competency when you igl a team that if you say let's flash and go into this site they don't just go Woohoo, and flash themselves right there, there is some expected competency yes, you're not supposed yes. to micro them all yes but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not that they're incompetent maybe it's literally that the calls are incompetent i mean we're <laughs> we're, we're speculating again because we don't know what's actually happening but i've seen moments where igls are making the right calls and like you say the players are not reacting but i've also seen moments for myself where i make calls and i realize later the calls i'm saying are bullshit like the stuff that i'm <laughs> saying are ridiculous yeah but, but i feel like even like if the calls were bullshit it doesn't feel like they're like doing things together like the like what josh brought up like it, it feels like their rotates are always so weirdly timed and also there's still like so many just like personal mistakes that just shouldn't be happening at this level the economy is still getting trolled it all consistently. starts like from the i mean it all the, starts the smokes from that we're missing like there are things that go beyond just like a bad idea like there are just like fundamental no, but... pieces of utility that are like trolling and falling apart like yes we can blame scream to an extent but also like Everyone else needs to get their shit together too. Yeah. By the way, of, of course. So, but... by the way, Carmen Core will actually have a win. By the way, <laughs> they beat BBL at the beginning. They're still negative fifty-two in terms of their round differential, <laughs> and frankly, they're getting a bad rap in the community right now because we're not covering Pacific. Because if we were watching any of the Talon games, oh my lord, we should be going as hard on that team, especially with the fucking expectations that they had. They're negative forty-seven with zero wins, putting Pat on a different agent every fucking game, having no <laughs> clue what they're doing. I mean, absolute. Just horrendous performance out of talent after looking fairly decent and making it to what was it like the quarterfinals or something of lock in? Get a fucking grip. What's going on over there? And we're not molding about it because it's happening at fucking 4 a.m. So none of us are watching it live. Yeah, I mean, Sliggy is obviously, but the rest of us are around. asleep. Yeah, so you're Do they nice really end? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, don't know what's Sorry, going. I, don't, I don't know what's going on over there, honestly. They're crazy a lot. They're like, uh, they looked so good at lock in, and then they've added Patsy in. And I don't know if he's a different player than when that I was watching, but yes, apparently, he can, apparently he can play, apparently can play everything. <laughs> like apparently, it's apparently he can play everything. They just put him on a different agent every single map. Um, and then maybe they're trying some of the most outrageous stuff I've seen, like the triple. Like he, when I'm calling it outrageous, you know it's outrageous. Like triple jewel is like. That yeah. is, that's a mental one. And like, I saw an interview where they said it was working in prax. And I was joking on my stream where I said, like, if I was, say that, like, it, say I was in Liquid and Heretics tried this against us. And, and like, you go into a prac and you see them lock in Triple Duelist. I'm telling my whole team to just let them take every single round so they use this and the actual officials. <laughs> And, and, and like, I'm literally messaging their coach after and I'm just going, man, you, you're, you're a genius, dude. Like, this is incredible. And I honestly think that's what happened. Like, that's the only thing I can think is like, they play, they, they must have played against RRQ or something. And RRQ were just like, damn, like, you guys, triple duelist on split. Like, you got it down. Like, no, they, they ran their, like, beat hit every single time and it worked. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it's, it's madness over there. Um, yeah, talent, yeah. talent, talent trolling. RRQ actually look kind of incredible, though. I don't know what's going on there. Is yeah, that, I, don't know if... I mean, RRQ were one of those teams where, I mean, we've been, I've been having conversations with people in my chat and stuff. People love asking who the worst team in franchising is, as if, as if it's, <laughs> they just want the schadenfreude. It's unbelievable. And people are asking like, oh, you think Carmen Core would be able to beat Crew or be able to beat, you know, RRQ was always the team that people were bringing up. And then RRQ just destroyed Secret this week. They look, they look decent this week. I don't know that like I looked at them this week and I was like damn this looks like a legit like good team like that I could see go into a like the Tokyo land I know it's a little maybe a little bit too late for them but I was looking at this game thinking damn they look incredible right now like they didn't really do many mistakes they looked in, like so good everyone was hitting their shots it was all together sick xx like I loved, so, I loved watching this game so Sliggy I do want to ask you because you know we're unqualified to really cut, uh, talk about this because I don't think any of us caught all of the Pacific games this I week just but the game Right, but in terms of those teams that are at the bottom, so like your EG and crew, 
your BBL, your Carmen Corp, and then your DFM Talon, and let's yeah. throw RRQ in there as well. Yeah. There was a quadruple elimination tournament. <laughs> okay. But every time you lost, you advanced. Who's winning that tournament? Every or who's time losing you lost, that you tournament? Advance. Um, if K, if K Corp, because obviously they could win the first game if there was no demos out of them. But if there's demos out on K Corp, <laughs> then they would lose the whole thing. They they just play the same. Like, if even if you're a worse team, like on paper, like you would still beat them. You can't do the same thing over and over again. It's crazy one dimensional, mad. Well, there you go. You heard it from the expert. You can stop asking me now every time. <laughs> um, Does I think Talon it's... beat K-Core, though? Oh, yeah, I, I, mean... I think so. I, I trust enough in that. Well, actually, maybe they're going <laughs> it, it, it would be an absolute shit show, wouldn't it be? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I couldn't even imagine it. But I would like to think that a, a coach or an IGL that understands the game would be able to ante them so, super easy. That they... Like, like literally on, on split when I'm watching them and, they, and when I'm just watching K-Corp and they, they go take middle and then they try and get a kill and then they don't get a kill and then it gets into that 40 second mark and then they get into a heaven but there's, there's been no kill and they just sit in heaven for 20 seconds. I'm just like, damn, they've, they haven't played a prac where people like are giving them space for free yeah. uh, and they're just, they're just not decisive of it. So honestly, I, I just think you can, you can outplay them by <laughs> not even giving them a kill and you'll be fine on most of these maps. They make too many mistakes. While we're on the topic of Pacific, um, we're not really covering it in this episode, but this week, Gen G versus DRX is happening, and that looks like a banger. So if you don't watch any of the Pacific games, you should probably tune in for that. It's two undefeated teams, 4-0 and zero versus 4-0. and zero. It's the two top Korean teams playing off against each other. King against his former team as well. There's like so many reasons to tune in here, and Gen G have been doing extremely well, uh, capitalizing on that close game they had against Loud at lock-in to uh, really bring some momentum forwards into the Pacific region. So this should be sick. If you can watch it or yeah. catch a VOD, I would recommend it. And King's probably playing the best I think I've ever seen him play. But that's one of those games actually where I think I'm obviously DRX are favorites, but I think I'd be tempted to say that Genji win that just because of how good they look. Like I just think they might be able to clinch this. It's a real, it feels like a real 50 50 game. So it would make sense to go for the, the underdogs in this one. Like a Furia pick. <laughs> like a Furia versus Loud pick. <laughs> maybe, maybe not that one. You, you lot were hyping them up way too much. I watched that and I was like, damn, you lot are. Yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah, they, they got rolled. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, let's do some predictions. So we are terrible at predictions on the show here, Sliggy. I don't know whether you've seen, but we cursed some teams dramatically last week. So I'm hoping that you'll stop us from cursing people. It's, some of the games have been hard to call, though. I'll give you that. Some of them have been uh, pretty hard. Like, people will ask me on stream, and then I'll say something, and then that team will lose. I'll be like, oh, damn. At least I didn't, pub at least I didn't too publicly do it. Right. <laughs> like it on, I haven't got it on a YouTube or anything. It'll be fine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> who, who would do that? <laughs> Every week. All right, so the first game coming up here in our EMEA Week 4 predictions is Team Heretics versus Team Liquid. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> God. Oh no. Oh no. I think this, this one is a guarantee though, isn't it? To some degree, like Liquid have been playing no. well enough to be able to get through Heretics. I asked it... Kurt to change my prediction literally 20 minutes ago, or before <laughs> the show started. I had Why? Heretics. Why? I had Heretics. Because oh, I just wait, you like had Heretics? I had Heretics. Why did you have Heretics? To... Because I just feel like Heretics are due for, for a big win and Team Liquid are due for a big loss. It's, you, what does the word do you mean there? Do, like there's do, some like, cosmic fate involved. Yes, yes, that's how Valorant works. What do you, how do you think the 30% law is achieved? It's because <laughs> people are due their dues. Uh, right. But realistically, like, okay, Heretics is not playing fantastic, but they also aren't sh completely shooting the bed. You know, like, uh, they, they're oh, able no. to capitalize on beating Navi when they're trolling. Like, that sort of thing. And Team Liquid... Outside of the Carmine Core game, but we've already established that we can't really watch that entirely and think anything of it. Outside of that game, a lot of trolling still, a, a, a lot of trolling still, and they have they have they have this switch now. I think where they can go into the different modes because in that game against who was it Footballist where they took their their win um, by safe going insane on ascent. I thought they were going to lose that series 2-0 because the split started so horribly. It started like lock-in split. Um, type beat and 
So I think that that can, that can rear its head again, especially if you go into a game where you think you're favored, where the community thinks you're favored, and that affects how players play. So that's why I was a little scared of it. I'm still going to go Team Liquid. I'm not going to break the guarantee or anything like that. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that this is... I, I don't think any Team Liquid game at this point against any competent team is a guarantee. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. I don't, I don't feel crazy confident. Like I said earlier, Her- Heretics are one of those teams that if they get a good start, like if they get a good start, they they can win these kind of games. Um, and also, I'm a little bit worried about Liquid's map pool going into this. Um, I know that Heretics had probably the worst pile I've ever seen. Like I'll just put it out there; it was horrendous. <laughs> but um, I, apparently, it's been going a lot better for them in practice. So I'm actually, I'm just trying to look at all the maps that Liquid can win, and it's kind of kind of close on a few of these maps in my mind so yeah it's a little bit it doesn't feel doesn't feel uh too confident in my books but yeah i still think they should win i'm looking forward to seeing safe play against um kellogg's as well i feel like that if kellogg's is having a game i feel like safe has been pretty great yeah he's amazing yeah so uh, i'm looking forward to that clash yeah i just have like no confidence like i feel like there hasn't been a game from heretics that like can give you confidence their only like win was against carmen core sure they were playing fanatic navi they took that map off navi but it was just like the lotus it was looking tragic from Navi. I-, I just haven't seen it with this team yet whereas liquid who has been doing some trolling have had maps where i'm like okay this feels like we're getting closer to what this team should be safe clears it's like i'm pretty confident that this that's definitely uh, been a tough strength of schedule, though, early on for Team Heretics. They've played against Fnatic Na'Vi already. They took a map off one of them. They played against Foot, too, didn't they? And lost. Oh, they did play against Foot, Foot and yeah. they got rolled. It was like 13-5, 13-something. 13 it, was, it was like super yeah. dominant. From- yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm interested. All right, let's take a look at the next game, though. The next one is uh, probably the game of the week, to be honest. It's Foot playing against Giants. Who have we got here? Oh, it's not a guarantee. Oh, okay, okay. Oh. only one of us going for foot, actually. Um, I'm interested here. Mimi, you looked surprised there. Do you think that foot is just a default pick? No, I don't think foot is a default pick. I feel like this matchup is is pretty even. Like, I, I think uh, Giants have looked good thus far. But for me, it's just like, on paper, I don't think foot is favored. I think this, this is definitely me, like, picking on an upset. I would say it's probably, like, 60-40 maybe for the side of Giants. But I feel like for foot, in every one of these games where I feel like they're going to go out of it, they've, they've come in and they've had, like, some ridiculous individual performances to clutch up at the end of games. They've been really good at just, like... I think improving uh, throughout what we've seen throughout EMEA thus far. I like having Ada Captain full time on the roster now, and I think that it will be a close game. I think this is like the kind of game that will like define in my head like who is the third place team in EMEA. But I think if there's a punt that I'm willing to take, like Foot is like a team that I've like predicted against a lot in the first few weeks, and this is the moment where I'm like, all right, we've seen some good stuff from them. I think this is like a worthy risk to take on Foot. I think it's interesting that um, I, I, I think it's going to be a very interesting clash on Lotus in particular. I think Foot have got a very unique composition that they're running there that they're finding a lot of value out of. Um, I suppose it's not that unique anymore now that they've swapped to playing the double controller, but previously with the Sage, it was a bit bonkers. But anyway, the fact that they're running Neon and finding a ton of success on Lotus is quite different to other teams' approaches. And Giants have just swapped to a comp that has no Sentinel on that map with Nookie playing the Viper. And the way in which they were playing, they absolutely dominated Koi. But I think quite a lot of that was just getting extraordinarily good reads on where Koi were going around the map and stacking those areas. Um, so I am really intrigued to see if that um, if that goes differently. And also who even picks it? Because Giants last few games, their map pick has always been really, really dominant. And then their opponent's map pick, they've just like, you know, gotten through it by virtue of being a decent team. Um, which seems to me to indicate that Giants are much more focused on like their game plan on maps. And you can see it in the way that they like play their Lotus and stuff. That much more than trying to anti their opponent in any way. So I think this is going to be a great game. I really don't know who's going to win it. I think it is a bit of a coin flip, but I like Giants. Yeah, I think this is a banger game. I'm um I'm kind of the same as you. I'm excited for Lotus because I don't... Okay, this is going to sound a little bit harsh, but I don't really count a lot of Foot's wins on Lotus as like 
super legit or in terms of us looking at it too much like they'd be um rrq obviously in lock in those fine then they played 100 thieves and 100 thieves look lost on the map they're playing like a, a, a cypher which i just think is just not a thing um then then they played heretics where they won double pistol so so that i'm kind of like yeah they had the momentum on that one is like 13 13 9 or something then they played liquid that has no sentinel on that map and that in my mind is a little bit weird but again they're going to be going up against that most likely again um and then vitality they played against a single harbor so i don't think they've been like properly tested on the lotus sure. um and i i'm thinking that maybe gives them some false confidence um we'll kind of see they, they definitely look very good at it but I, I still don't think they've been properly tested on the map, so I'm kind of excited for that. Um, I think, like we were saying, I think they're going to pick it, though. I think they're going to have the confidence on it. It seems kind of how they roll, with just getting a getting a map under their belt that they feel very confident on. So, yeah, that's exciting. But in terms of the maps, I just think the Giants takes it. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next game. The next one is... Just put in here for the schadenfreude to be honest it's carmen corp playing against navi <laughs> yep if if there was a game for carmen corp to win that would that nobody would see coming at yep. all yep. this would be the funniest one for them to win i mean i'm not saying it's happening at all but it would be funny have carmen corp played lotus once since they looked good at it at locking yep. No. What? And, and, it, and it literally looks incredible. Like I, it looks so at, good. Out of the whole of the lock-in, I was like, "Damn, Carmen Cole have the best attack side on Lotus." Like I was so convinced, and then they just never picked it since. And I'm just like, "What are they doing?" I mean, they must so, be losing it in scrims, right? Because otherwise, it just makes there's no logical reason at all there. They haven't played yeah. Pearl either. <laughs> yeah, like the Pearl looked all right too. Like they had a really, really slow attack side on Pearl. But of all the maps, I feel like that's one of the best ones to just have incredibly, incredibly slow defaults into a B exec or into an A exec. Like, it just works for their style. And they haven't played it. Yeah, I think we're, <laughs> I think we're missing out on a few of their better maps. I, um, I had Doom Bros in my chat, and I asked him to just let Angel just go full troll for this one. I want to see the craziest comps ever. Oh. So I'm a little bit excited to see uh, oh. if that happens. And that, how, could be, that could be a win condition yeah, for K-Corp if he just goes troll, a little bit wild. How troll do Na'Vi have to get for K-Corp to win this? Oh, real troll. Like Rain, your... Rainers. <laughs> Yoru Rainers. Yeah, I think so. Angel back on Yoru, too. It's not just CNED Yoru. It has to be Angel back on Yoru. Okay. That was the okay. worst timeline. I have like blocked that out of my memory. But, but... the Yoru looked good though, right? This time? The C Ned one? I thought it did. Yeah. yeah. It was okay. I mean, it one it was okay. I thought it looked really good. Yeah. good. It looked no, so much better. No. Yes, have... better than better, better than like the prior time they were in Yoru, but come on, good? <laughs> come no, it, on, it, good? It, 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 they had five rounds that were set that was actually pretty legit. I think yeah, that counts the, as good in my books. Oh my god! Yeah, I, I, I was, oh. I was there with you. We were having this discussion last week. I actually thought that I, I was fairly impressed with. They had like a lot of different ideas of what they wanted to do with it. I was, I was telling Bala yeah, last they, time, but they when they played Angel Yoru last time, they had one idea. They I know, had one thing. I know. But they relied on the TP. They, they relied on Angel TPing under stairs like fifteen times out of like their twelve attack rounds, like. <laughs> yeah, there was some cooler ideas, and obviously they were they were prepped with some nightfall your TP shit stuff. But like, but, but come on, good, good. <laughs> Didn't it like take them to like the? I'm pretty sure it was like the last or second to last round that they even ever did like the nightfall stuff. It was just like the same thing. They were playing. They were playing BBL. They were playing BBL. Like, ugh. I I don't I don't feel like it. we we do definitely see Lotus in this game though, right? Like Carmen yes. Core can't get away from picking Lotus against Navi. It's just the most Predictive. obvious pick. Navi are bad yeah. at it. Carmen Core previously oh, were good I at mean, it. Like who knows? Navi might just troll and switch up their veto and veto Lotus again and like, yeah, I suppose. And bring Icebox because Carmine is trying to avoid Icebox now too. But I mean, surely I feel like Navi... that's a good direction. You get like a scent or split or Icebox, and K Core is just like. On, like, but surely Navi's reason for banning Icebox is that they're working on it and they're waiting to unveil it later on. Maybe. You don't want to unveil it against... I mean, you, I guess they could you, just you, run an you old You cannot comp. read the machinations of Angel on the fucking <laughs> map vetoes and prep. There's just no way you can. Yeah, fair. Fair. All right, let's have a look at our final Pred of the Week then. It is Vitality playing against BBL. Also, Icebox Ooh. leaving the pool. Sorry. 
I just screwed oh, up. Oh, Icebox is leaving this week. I've thought about that. No, Wait, no, it's next, by... next week. Next week. Oh, next right. Week, yeah. right. It's week five, the, right? They're yeah. planning ahead. Yeah. What game is this? Uh, this is Vitality, Vitality BBL. against BBL. Oh, okay. Yeah, BBL. <sighs> Dude, they, I don't get BBL, man. They should. They should eventually be good. Like they, they, like they should eventually be good. But they just, they just can't close games out. I swear. Like it's the same thing from last year. They just can't close games out. Ever they have they have opportunities to win games and they just can't close them. I don't know why, but maybe that's this it. team. Uh, could this team end up just going winless despite not being the worst team? Yeah. Yes. Brutal. Well, what's the rest of their schedule? Good question. They haven't played Heretics, Navi Koi, Orphan. Liquid Foot. No, they played. Get, they those get so, those are some probably. winnable games. Like yeah, the games yeah. against yeah. Heretic, the, Koi. There is, there is an winnable. upset in there somewhere. There's, there's, there's got to be. be at least one. That's what, I, that's what I say every time, every season with BBL. There's an upset. I predict one of the, the, the most easy upsets ever and just never comes. And then it comes the next freaking game. But like... <laughs> Some some of these games they look incredible, like the the Haven game, the Ascent game against Fnatic, for example. Like they looked really good, and then they just lose the series anyways because it's Fnatic. But like, <sighs> yeah. But I mean, was this team any good on Bind? <laughs> is that the cope that like Icebox coming out and Bind coming in is gonna? I remember help them being win? particularly bad on Bind, but I don't know if that's. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that's the case. It might have been like SMB or something last year. Yeah, I mean, SMB were ridiculous at one point, running Killjoy on Bind repeatedly. So, I don't know. The Turkish scene's always been a bit a bit crazy there. Uh, is it, I feel like Vitality should be good here, right? Yeah. There, yeah, there shouldn't I be a risk. So. They're, looking, they're looking decent. If Destrian's, if Destrian's playing this good, then I'm kind of scared of them. They actually look like a good team. All right. So that brings us on then to the power rankings. So let's let's power rank some EMEA teams. I feel like this is going to be somewhat easy at the top and the bottom, and then a bit of a mess in the middle of the pack, to be honest. But that's a kind of cool place for EMEA to be, because I did think that middle of the pack was going to end up looking pretty weak, and it's it's been better than I thought. Have you been doing personal power rankings yourself, Soligi? Nah, I've been Free avoiding clout. it. Yeah, I know people <laughs> love them. Everyone, every time I look over in chat, someone's mentioning it. I just, I just avoid them. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> We've roped you in this time. Where, where do you want to begin, people? This feels like actually fairly reasonable from last week. Like I feel like the only things that are really changing are just like a, maybe a little bit of chaos in the middle for the most part. But like top and bottom, yeah. like top two, bottom three, still feel like that's good. That's about right. I mean, Heretics winning a map over Na'Vi, looking somewhat more competent than BB. I mean, we had BBL in this spot because they looked decent on Ascent and they beaten Fnatic on Ascent, right? But I think long term, probably heretics have more chances than BBL, do they? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the only thing I see here is like heretics, BBL, and then eventually, I, I guess these little things are the, is like a big gap between, right? Yeah, the, like, yeah. yeah it's like Fnatic. a tier gap. Okay. I mean, eventually the Fnatic and Navi one will be removed, but we haven't seen that yet. So I think it's cool to keep it there. That, that's literally the only change I'd make, to be honest. And I agree with that change. I'm like kind of. I, I don't see how I can... Maybe maybe we move the tier gap of maybe. under Koi up. Koi, yeah. yeah. Up one. Oh, yeah. But even then, I don't think, like, maybe, maybe it's even above Team Liquid. I don't know. Like, that's that's the place because I think, I think Heretics it's... has a chance against Liquid. I think it's too early to tell. I think after next week, we'll know whether Liquid yeah. and Heretics are really in the same tier. True. But I think it's kind of early to, to know that kind of thing. Um, what about the movement in the... Is there any movement in the middle of the pack with... Obviously, Giants, Giants and Foot, we were predicting Giants to be a little better than Foot, but, I mean, Vitality come off a big win against Carmen Corp. Does that move them up the rankings <laughs> at all? No. no? I, I think the only argument you could make is maybe swapping Foot and Giants, but I think, like, just looking at form from the games we've seen thus far, I feel like, for me, what Foot has had is, like, kind of like the craziness in the late game and, like, the individual pop-offs and, like, the one-off, like, Ascent comp and things like that that don't really give me, like, an idea to be like, okay, I've seen the consistency from this team to rate them above Giants. I think those two teams are very, very close. Like, there shouldn't be a tear gap or anything, but I still think that, like, in terms of form, Giants has looked better. Like, they've just looked solid this week and last week and have just been consistently pretty darn good in most of their games. 
Definitely some games coming up this week, though, that could change things around. You know what? This felt like a coherent power ranking segment where it's just a small tweak adjusting. The America's one is just awful. It's, it's almost like doing it every week. Like, it's reasonable changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it wasn't in much. America's. It's like yeah, all but over you the guys place. trolled the yeah. America's one. No, come on. We didn't <laughs> troll. No, that, that is, that is, get was, get, come on. Now. No, you I, guys I agree. troll. No, I agree. That's, come that's on. Elon. on. Well, okay, not, you guys it, have to you guys have to fix it then. Okay, we're gonna get to the uh, next. I'm well, a fury over hyper, gone, but, like, and uh, you're the world's <laughs> biggest fury over hyper. No, Even but, I'm but, but, the, but then you uh, the, make the argument then. You, you you come back, go go in the past, get on the episode, and make the argument because nobody's making the fucking argument about why. Yeah, I'll go back and fucking make an edit. It's By loud. It was oh, loud. No, but why? Well, what well, loud was shit? Because it's loud. Because they lost one series and you can't judge a team by the fiber of four, one week. It's an inherently flawed no, power no. rank. One, one week? No, it wasn't one week. It was two weeks. And it was... And, oh, that right, makes anyways. a big difference. To be honest. They were trying. Yeah, they were trying stuff as well. They were trying out new comps. Of you course, guys are crazy. of course, of course. But... They still, I mean, all right, never mind, never mind, never mind. Never mind. The just got to take the L, Barlow, just got to take the L. Uh, yeah. Honestly, yeah, okay. a lot, I was talking to the people in the, the Brazilian talent and the Brazilian fans and stuff, a lot, a lot of the Brazilian team was expecting Furia to win that game too. But I think it's just a lesson in, like, loud. <laughs> you know, it's. <laughs> I think some people are going to predict that kind of stuff against Na'Vi as we get deeper on into the playoffs and stuff as well without realizing that, Navi are gonna be good. Like if they just yeah. choose to be good for a week, they're going to be a yeah. lot better than what we've seen from yeah. them. So we would far. have the exact same thing in EMEA if Navi was like at like uh, if there was any other team. If there wasn't so much more turmoil down in three fifth in, in EMEA, if there wasn't that, we'd have the exact same conversation in Navi about like football as being up above them or something like that. It's yeah. just it's just the nature of week to week play where teams are experimenting. That's what happens. Is their power looks less. Keep coping, Bala. Keep coping. You were wrong. No, I actually, I actually think Ball is, Ball is it's, actually it's, onto something. I, I literally said, I literally said last last episode, I said Loud are probably going to be number one by the end of like in a couple of weeks, but right now they're not. That's that's how it works. I mean, I also predicted Loud, but still put Fury above them, so I was just playing both yeah. sides. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> is this good? Uh, are we done with this? Yeah, I think this, this is, is good. Yeah, right? This is I think this feels good. Uh, what is the approval? thing that could what would what would mess this up the worst out of all the games that are happening? Because like Giants Foot wouldn't mess it up. Like Heretics, Heretics Liquid. Heretics Liquid is the biggest mess up. Well, I guess K Corp Navi. K Corp Navi. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, K Corp Navi would be. Dude, so that wouldn't funny. change anything to me. That would that would be like the most like expected dumb shit that would happen. <laughs> that wouldn't change anything for me. We would literally not even move Carmen Corp or Navi. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually just insane hater status. Yeah. I mean, maybe PBL vitality would shift things, but that would still just be kind of changing in the middle. I think that could like, if there's an upset there, that could like disprove the, where we're placing the tier gaps. But yeah, yeah, I don't feel like it would be super unreasonable. Like I think that like what you're saying, like surely PBL will get an upset at some point. Surely it's bound to happen. Don't feel like it's this week, but it would shift things if it did. Okay, then. Well, I think that just about wraps everything up then with uh, EMEA. Thank you for joining us, Sliggy. Oh, yeah, thank you for having me. It was nice. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the NA madness, America's madness. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. Enjoy your 12-hour shift at the coaching factory. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, this week's going to be a bit nuts of uh, Pacific moving an hour earlier. But, yeah. Yeah, for anybody that's, um, that still is looking for where to find Sliggy, you will see him live about 16 hours of the day co-streaming whenever Valorant is on. Yeah, the Super Week this week is going to rinse you. So good luck yeah. with that. Thanks so much. I appreciate having me. All right. Thank you very much. So we're going to be covering Game Changes and we're going to be covering VCT Americas with Mel, who I believe is hopping in fairly shortly here. I might have, honestly, might have dismissed Sliggy a bit early, but we'll go to a break and we'll figure stuff out and we'll, uh, we'll pop back. Yay. Yay. Stream probably won't break. And if it does, we'll blame Kurt anyway. Yeah, I made like a cool little hot swap thing. So I'm going to press this button. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And kaboom. So right now, my program is telling me that if Mel is connected to the chat, she, she's here right now. But I don't think she's connected right now yet. I just told oh, her. Oh, there she is. Yeah, yeah, she's here. Oh? You should be able Hello. to hear us. Yay. Here, I'll be right back. Hello, we are live right now as well, but we're in on break screen, so there's Everybody no expectations. But yeah, people can people can hear you. 
So don't leak all of the crazy roster moves that are happening. Oh, that I, I was planning on that. Okay, my, I'll save it for after. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> all right, we've muted our mics now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, how to burn bridges instantly. <laughs> all right, get some water. I'll be right back. Okay. Okie dokie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fearlessly boldly for the first time ever open the chat oh god and see what people were talking about <laughs> the first time ever i've never opened the plaid chat valorant chat before it's pretty well good. i have when i've i have when i've not been on the show hello people hello everyone everybody type sideshow l yeah true <laughs> actually true i mean people just saying egg <laughs> <laughs> What's the secret to your hair? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no secret. It's Hello, just Melon. A sharp knife. <laughs> Hello, Melon. Mel, do you ever get people calling you Melon? Um, honestly, ever since the rise of that of that term, I have not been because I feel like it is derogatory now. So <laughs> therefore I, I I have not been called that. I hope I I don't start getting called that. That'd be nice. Yeah, I, I feel like that would be a great... I mean, I, I, listen, I don't want to put it in people's heads, but any any Mel whiffs, the Mel on would, you know, with the capital L. That would, be... that would kill me, I think. I think I'd retire. That, that's just too much. That's just too fucking much. I can curse, right? Uh, and yeah, I can see people in the chat talking about Pacific. So the reason that we haven't been covering Pacific very much is that the matches are happening at, I think it's 1 a.m., like, this is going to sound silly, but 1 a.m. Pacific time. Like 1 a.m. <laughs> like West Coast, like L.A. time. Uh, oh, no, it's 3 a.m. Some of these games as well. So unless we're catching the VODs of them, we are not able to cover it. And we've got a super week of America's coming up. So to be honest with you, Pacific is just perfectly in the time zone where it's a massive pain in the ass for us to be able to... Um, all have watched and so basically he, here's here's what you would get what you would get is one person would have watched all of the games because they had a bit more time than everybody else and they'd be monologuing for 20 minutes about the pacific region and that's not really that's not compelling television, <laughs> this isn't television thank you josh. producer josh <laughs> yeah sliggy could have covered them yeah do you want a sliggy monologue for 20 minutes about pacific while we all just sit there and nod <laughs> I mean, people probably would want that. Yeah, pre yeah, people probably would want that, to be honest. But yeah, we we will cover Pacific um, later on, and we'll do some recaps and stuff like that. But if you're a Pacific fan, I'm afraid you're just going to be out in the desert for a couple weeks. But yeah, if you if you are a Pacific fan, genuinely, Sliggy is doing live co streams of those games. So if you want somebody oh, to give you like analytical coverage. I would highly recommend going and watching his vods. Yeah, so he's the goat. A lot of uh, EMEA folk are doing it because it's easier to schedule for them. So like, right, right. Uh, Sue, it's, it's still Tom. not easy. Like, I live no. in the UK, and that shit is the wrong yeah. time zone for me anyway. While I'm in the UK, what time is it in UK uh, for? Pacific I think games? the games start at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. or something, mm. and I'm trying to cover America's too, which finishes at like 2 a.m. So. I'm not sleeping for six hours and then getting up and coaching. Yeah, for you it's bad because you're watching America's 100. Ah, oh, right. You, yeah, yeah. If the others are going to bed at a reasonable time, I suppose yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> it's like an insane amount of Valorant. Like I, I feel like I'm just trying to watch like America's and EMEA, and hmm. even that feels like so much content. It would be a funny segment where like one person knows and the rest are just bullshitting the entire time <laughs> about. The Pacific Games by just looking at VLR. I it's think like that'd be really us. funny. Just yes. lie. That'd be great. <laughs> Hi, Mel. Hi, Mel. Hey. Hello. Okay, we're back. We're going to talk Game Changers. We're going to talk Americas with our fantastic guest, Mel. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I've been like on break since Game Changers. I've just been sleeping all day. Heading to the gym. This is like my first productive task of the week, I think. <laughs> I would say hitting the gym might be more productive. I don't know how productive this is going to end up being. Oh, boy. 
Yeah, but you've, um, well, Bala, you were casting the game as well, but Mel, you've you've started your road down establishing another dynasty under a different name within Game Changers North America by the look of things. Uh, very clean, no map dropped in the, uh, uh, in the in the run toward the finals. There you go, version one on top. That's, <laughs> what, what was, the, was it um, more challenging than it has been previously or was it just a cakewalk again? Oh, that's a good question. I think it was challenging in its own ways, like leading up to this point, but the event seemed as easy as like the last game changers I played with Cloud9 domestically. Not the Berlin one, obviously. <clears throat> right. But <clears throat> yeah, for sure. It's definitely had its own challenges, just building a new team like entirely versus like doing it with the team you've been with for like one, two years already. But it's been a pretty fun experience. I think that, I think that too, we didn't even play our technical best, at least to me in, G uh, in the grand finals. But that, that's, I can save that for later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. Like, the, the series you had in the upper bracket finals was way cleaner than the series you had in the, in the finals. Like, particularly on Ascent, like, it wasn't as clean as I would have expected from, from you guys, especially with how floor popped off in, like, the earlier stages of the bracket. But, no, it was, I mean, it was ridiculously easy. <laughs> <laughs> from what I could tell, it was ridiculously easy, so... Yeah, congrats on that. Yeah, I mean, super, super sick to see you continue that. That's now, for, for you and Lexi, you've continued to have never lost a Game Changers, except for the LAN, or at least a Game Changers in NA, going all the way back to that, what was it, like the pre-Game Changers for the women summer showdown, whatever the hell, 50K <laughs> event. So that's a pretty sick record to maintain. But I guess I, I just kind of want to ask, like, since we have you here, what was the progress like to kind of, like, redevelop with it? Ball has just disappeared. Goodbye, uh, Bala. Oh, yeah, never mind. Just... What was it like to have to like completely redevelop like with a new team? Because you played with Cloud9 for like what, like two years straight with the same team getting to build upon that structure. What was it like to like have to restart for the first time in like so long? It was honestly all pretty sudden, like having to restart. The team died like a couple days after Berlin, to be honest. Like Berlin ended. I ha I had like two days off to like spend with my boyfriend and my cat, and then. Team died, and I was like, "All right, well, like we're gonna go our separate ways. Um, I'm gonna go with Lexi." And at that time, I heard about version one, and I was like, "Oh, this is a sick opportunity!" Like I've always heard about these players being like insane on their respective teams, and it's honestly a completely different experience because with Cloud Nine, it was like I had grinded with those girls for a period of two years, and we had gotten from the bottom together. Like I, I looked back on those like old magical vods, like not even Cloud9 White, magical vods, and I was like, oh my God, I was <laughs> shit. We were all so <laughs> shit. And then just getting from the bottom and learning everything about the game, like understanding tech FPS at a fundamental level, learning that all with the team, to going to a team where it's like, I already, we all kind of already have this knowledge and building from there is so different. And it's been such an awesome, challenging experience for me. But not challenging because like they're bad. It was just challenging because it was like different, and it's been different, especially as it terms like as it comes to like being a leader. Because again, when you grow up with the same people, I feel like it was a, like level of like we were all there together, right? So it's not as big of like a leadership position. But on this team, it's like I actually feel like mother. Like I feel like mom. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, it's like I feel old. I'm like 22. I'm turning 23, and it's like I'm not even that much older. Like the next oldest person's like 20. And I feel like old. I'm like, damn, I'm ancient, bro. I have like wisdom and experience that I can bring to this team. <laughs> like that's when it starts hitting that like, damn, I'm at that point in my career when I'm like hailed for my wisdom and experience. <laughs> it's, it's been fun. It's been fun being like the older experienced um, person bringing like un un uh, unentertained knowledge to the roster from before. It also feels like with the addition of like the the... I don't want to say new players, but the new roster that you're now playing with, it feels like there's different dynamics there in terms of having Fluorescent at the front where she's just cracked. I mean, just absolutely <laughs> insane. Um, how does that change the dynamic for, for you and for the team? Like the different strengths and weaknesses between C9 and this team is like we have just, I think, one of the best duels players, like honestly, in the world. And obviously I'm biased because I'm on the team. But there's shit that floor. I, I can curse, by the way, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. past yeah. the first minutes, ten minutes. You're good. Yeah. Okay. If we Sweet. brought you on first, you would have ruined it. But thankfully, oh, fuck, Alexa, I'm sorry. Sorry. thankfully we got Sliggy on first, and he's very mild mannered. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that guy couldn't shit talk anyone to save his life. It's actually incredible. He'll watch I mean, the he... most horrendous run of Valorant and be like, "It's not looking good." Like, yeah, motherfucker, <laughs> it's not looking good. It looks awful. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> 
rose is too so nice. nice. He's lovely. No, but having fluorescent at the like the head of the spear is uh, something insane that I can really lean on. It's something so different that I'm not really used to. This isn't any hate to anyone that ever played Duelist on Cloud9. Like I've played Duelist, Jazzy's played Duelist, Lexi's played Duelist, but I think it's uh, it's not hate to anyone to say the fluorescent's just insane. Just yeah. the things that she can pull off, I have never seen anyone else do. Like this one v two that she clutched, she's like, "Who the hell does that?" Like updraft, updraft, dash <laughs> backward, <laughs> and like gross. dodge the recall. Like, what is this? Like, who does this shit? So it's been awesome having her as part of the structure, and I think you know, reining her in was a big first step for us because on her previous team, she literally just ran it down. She literally <laughs> just one v nine, like ran it down. Obviously, uh, her team supported her, and like. You know, backed her up with some of the plays, but a lot of the shit she did was just purely individual. And so, with me and Lexi coming to the team and Effie's as well, it's been definitely a job of like, okay, let's rein her in and get her like some discipline. And like that alone has changed so much. Yeah, uh, the development she's had already has been so impressive. Like from watching her on Misfits, I totally agree with you. It's just like, okay, we have fluorescent. She's gonna go kill everyone. We lose the round, or we win it off of that. But with your team, it's like she's showing so much more like discipline, like being able to still have those pop off moments. Well also slowing things down getting her one pick pulling out like it really feels like you guys have found a balance of like putting the reins on her and also still allowing her to be the absolutely insane individual that she is but i kind of want to ask about like the development and the leadership because with cloud nine you guys had like kind of a rotating cast of coaches and like support staff throughout your time with that team like it was like i, I feel like something like four or five people throughout the history of your team that you all were working with but now switching over to, to v1 you're working with Effie's, who is another like new voice. And also, I believe, like his first time coaching in Valorant off of just being a pro player with V1 before. What's it been like with, with him on the team and kind of having maybe a more consistent voice to help you and Lexi out? Effie's has been like a godsend in terms of coaching. Like Game Changers lacks a lot of like good coaches because a good coach, like at least for me, it's like obviously a very high understanding of the game um, at like a high level. And also knowing what to work on with Game Changers teams. I think a lot of what I see in Game Changers for the past two years has been coaches that kind of do like Google Doc strats. They're like, okay, here's this Google Doc of all the strats we're going to run. You're going to run this on this on, on this round and then this on this round without actually explaining how the game really works. And that's, I mean, obviously I'm on these teams, but that's how it looks from the outside. Just playing these people for two years. Like there's a very like lack of mid-rounding, lack of like fundamental understanding of the game when I watch these games. And Effie encapsulates that alphaness that you need in a head coach where he's like, yo, you need to do this better. Like he's not going to shy away from criticism, which is something that I've experienced with other coaches who haven't really criticized like players or myself as much as like I would like them to because they're afraid of, you know, like stepping on people's toes. But Effie's is not that. He is hard on us. And like, it's it's to the point where, let's say we're scrimming like a good team and we throw a round that is just unthrowable, like on some KC shit for real. And he will be like, guys, I, I just canceled our scrims tomorrow uh, against fucking franchise teams and challengers teams. We're scrimming shitty for the rest of the week because you guys need to learn how to play against shitties. And I was like, that's so real. I was like, that's, <laughs> it sounds like really harsh, but it helps so much because we've been able to like enable and like pull up our skill floor from the bottom. And that's something that I struggled with um, before on like C9, I feel like where our skill floor wasn't um, like, it, it wasn't, it wasn't as high as it needed to be in order to like win a game changers or win really important games. So him coming in has been a godsend. Working with Effies has been amazing. He has a really high understanding of the game. He was an IGL before, so he's helped me a lot with my calling, um, especially. I feel like my calling has gotten a lot better in the past couple of months. I feel like I've really simplified the game, but I know when to complicate it. I know I, I just have such a better understanding. He's just an awesome coach. But before we like move on to other things within the Game Changers too, I wanted to ask, because you've hinted now twice, you're, you're screaming against partnership teams, right? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And you said Floor is the best player in the world, not just Game Changers. That's what you said. I'm not sure if you meant Game Changers, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely meant in the world. Uh, I, I, we definitely, to, to incur the rumors, we definitely scrim challengers and um, partner teams, or sorry, VCT America teams, 100% we do. I think I've seen the weirdest like dialogue on this, where I've seen people be like, Game Changers only scrim other Game Changers team. Now, why the fuck would we do that? Like, bro. <laughs> grief is that <laughs> obviously we scrim league partnered in challengers teams um and i say that she's the best in the world because we scrim these teams and she performs extremely well in these scrims and this isn't just from like a me mechanical level i hope to paint like a better picture of floor here her com her comms have in have just gotten so much better and have increased like tenfold over the past four months her comms are insane now she is like a very communicative jet she's very assertive in what she wants to do like she'll come over to a setup and sometimes like i've watched like 
rank streams and I watch a lot of comms videos from other teams and even from challengers and partnered I'll see their duelists be kind of like more quiet than I'd expect like obviously there's some sort of like leeway you can give duelists because they need to focus on their crosshair and their mech but Flora is like a perfect balance and she strikes that perfect balance where she calms exactly what she needs to and is assertive when she needs to be like she'll come over to a setup she'll be like Mel rotate over cat pick up cat with Lexi I'm gonna post a main for you like very assertive very good comms and very good action comms and knows exactly when it's like if you're getting a split on she'll be like let's fight this leg of the split come with me like flash for me like she's very assertive and like the dynamic between her and Lexi is also really good where like Lexi has like given her a bunch of comms and they can both have like that really good system to bounce off of so it's not just like mech with floor she's a really really heavy on comms for a duelist and I say this too because the first week, <laughs> the first week me and Lexi trialed, we played a partner team and we beat them in scrims. And I remember thinking at the beginning of the scrim, I was like, all right, guys, if we beat them, I'll sign the contract right now. And then we actually beat them. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. Okay, well, I guess this is a... So, uh, I... When Cloud9 White kind of dissolved and you realized that you had to reform a team, was there a thought about just going into the wider challenges circuit rather than game changers and seeking to take what you'd learned from that and going into you know uh, one of the teams that was hunting for an ascension win or a partnership win that was definitely on my mind at the time i had a lot going through my head after uh, berlin to be honest bad thoughts and good thoughts and definitely through my mind i was like i'd love to like make a i'd like to see if i could even just run like free agent team and try to make a challengers run with them but I ran across V1 and I saw so much potential in this team to not only be like a winning GC team, but actually push the boundaries of what Cloud9 White had done before, just right. in scrims with them. Like, like literally the first week, like I mentioned, we beat a partner team. I was like, holy shit, okay, maybe I can actually get the best of both worlds here with a Game Changers right. team where we can make a, a challenges run at some point. Uh, obviously the open qualifier was like um like we had three weeks of practice going to the first open qualifier so my expectations weren't we need to win this and make challengers obviously but later down the line in the next qualifier or next year's qualifier i see like a lot of potential with this team so in my head it was just like a best of both worlds uh, scenario because everyone on the team is fucking so wait, insane the one you uh, from my understanding from before was that you guys all came together to approach v1 it wasn't like that it was four or somebody on that team but like like yeah, very conveniently, you guys or you guys? yeah it was um it was very conveniently you had already signed floor nicole and uh, sorry noya and sarah already no. and there was very conveniently two slots open and i had reached out to them and they had told me yeah we already signed our contracts da, 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 da. i was like oh cool so um me and lexi are like a package deal like we can trial with you guys and that's pretty much how it went uh and it went pretty well i would i would say yeah <laughs> clearly yeah. Uh, so it's just to rehash that kind of point, though, about the open qualifiers and the challenger system and stuff. It's a lot weirder this year than it was last year. It's kind of more locked out if you don't get in right at the beginning. Um, last year, we saw a lot of teams, or at least a good bunch of teams, competing in game changers and then, you know, dipping their toes into open qualifiers or some other third-party tournaments and that kind of stuff. Whereas we haven't really seen, I know it's only April, right? It's not like 2023 is done and dusted. But am I wrong or is there not really that many opportunities to actually get involved in the wider VCT circuit um, if you didn't right from the off? It's not like there's open qualifiers every few months. There really isn't. Like you said, there's been one open qualifier. I think there were some rumors that maybe there'd be another for the split, a second split. But as we're seeing the second split started, there's no open qualifier. Like the bottom yeah. uh, two teams from each group aren't relegated or anything. And I feel like there could be some improvements there. Obviously, I'm not bashing these teams and challengers, but I think that for the rest of the scene, it'd be really healthy to have like some sort of relegation into like open qualifier mm -hmm. system because it does feel like, yeah, if you don't make the first qualifier, you're locked out of the entire year. I don't, unless there's something I'm missing, I think that I, I, had, I, I had a rumor, or not a rumor, I had a thought where maybe the premier system was going to drop and then they were going to run an open qualifier on the premier system. But as it stands, it's, it's coming out and it's in beta. So it's not even going to be happening anytime soon. I assume so maybe next, next year is going to be premier. Yeah. But it's yeah. kind of you know disheartening when it's like only one qualifier. And obviously, I know it's rougher in, like, in other regions and stuff like that, but it definitely sucks <laughs> playing in one and being chances? like, fuck. <laughs> Are you missing the chances of being able to compete like you know outside of the game changers circuit? Definitely miss those chances. I think right now there's going to be some NSG and some Knights tournaments. Like there's going to be that always where it's like a Knights monthly or I know NSG is hosting um, like a LAN and they're holding some weekly qualifiers. So that's pretty much the um, the most that we're going to get, to be honest. And I, our goals are just to like win these smaller tournaments and build us up for, to get ready for challengers next year. 
we're kind of already like set on there's not going to be other other uh, open qualifier, so we're just going to have to grind it out and see where we're at in like a year from now. Yeah, oh. I, I wanted to ask a yeah, little bit about some of the some of the other teams uh, in game changes that we saw because obviously Cloud Nine gets dissolved. You guys aren't the only two players from that. You have Exet, who has Bob and Cat, who used to be your teammates on C9. And then you also obviously still have Shopify, who ended up beating you guys when you were on Cloud9 last year to uh, make it to the grand finals of Game Changers Champions. But from looking at that first Game Changers, to me, it felt like for Shopify before, well, like towards the end of the year, they were starting to get closer, like occasionally taking maps off you guys in Game Changers and eventually um, beating Cloud9 at Game Changers Champions. In this one, it was just back to them just kind of getting rolled over by y'all uh and for exit actually playing a super duper close game against them to almost be that team into the grand finals do you think that for the rest of the teams in gc right now like do you think that there's anyone that's like starting to push to a level where they can compete with your team i think the teams that are the closest to compete with us because without saying it's probably shopify but my point i guess would be like the teams that are playing in co-ed there are like, I could count on one hand the teams that play in co-ed events and it's not, it's not very money. <laughs> I think, I think Complexity has been playing in a lot. Shopify plays in a few of them. Exet's been playing in a lot. Um, but it's just those teams really. Like I, there aren't, if you aren't playing in these events, you're just not going to beat us. It's the same thing. It's the same mantra as last year and the year before that, where on C9, I was saying the exact same thing. If you're not playing these for, code, uh, girl, yeah. it never <laughs> ends. And, and still interview. the number is the same. I can count on yeah. one hand yeah. still. Whoa. And it's like three of those teams are, um, are teams that have XC9 members on it. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, fuck. <laughs> but yeah. that's just the reality. I think to, be, to give credit to Shopify, I do think there is a tier I think they are a tier above the other teams, and then there's mm. us, which is a tier above them at the moment. Um, but it's it's kind of rough. I didn't really like come into this thinking there was going to be like a huge challenge. Obviously, the only challenge I thought would be like us beating ourselves. That's like the most like uh, the most common like trope ever, <laughs> obviously. But really, like coming into it, I was like, I don't feel like a lot of pressure um, against these teams against uh, unless we're playing like Shopify Rebellion because I know they're probably going to come into it trying even harder. You know, trying to. Um, to beat this like super team that's like hot on the block. So, talking about you potentially beating yourselves, how are you going to transfer the success that you're having into land performances a little better than happened last time? Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth that it was you beating yourselves, but it felt like um, it wasn't quite up to your expectations the last time that you'd been to a LAN event. And this game changes challenges is you know the, everything that all of this leads up towards. That has been on like the forefront of my mind since joining V1 is I do not want that to happen to me ever again. Losing Berlin was probably a top three worst feeling in the world. Not gonna lie, that was awful. I think the other two would probably be like losing out in like the open qualifiers for um for VCT like the years prior, but that was a pretty shitty feeling for sure. Cause I feel like that never should have happened. And I think it's a case of like what I mentioned earlier, which was us having a low skill floor. And that's something that we're already addressing on V1 since the creation of the team. This isn't like something that's taken us off guard. Me coming into the team, even before FE is, I was like, we need to work on our skill floor because that's what owned me on Cloud9. Like we should be able to win game changers on our worst day. Like that's just right. the reality of it. On our worst day, we should be able to beat these teams because they aren't like, we're not, these aren't partner teams or challengers teams. And we went against those teams in scrims. So this isn't something that we should be struggling with really. Um, at least if we're performing to our own expectation and trying as hard as we do in uh, in the partnered scrims that we get and the challenger scrims that we get. But that's like number one. And number two would be um, having more resources to like bootcamp and LAN, which V1 has given us like a ton of. I've already like bootcamp twice at V1. Um, I did um, earlier on this year without Sarah and Floor, um, like in January for the open qualifiers, I was there for about two weeks. And I just came back from three weeks in uh, Minnesota being at the full bootcamp facility with all my teammates. Uh, all my teammates there so already like pretty good start i think the next one be us going to lands we've already been to astral clash land we won that so for us that'd be huge because on cloud nine we only went to like one land together and that kind of sucks <laughs> when it's like you're going into like the biggest land of the year and it's like you've only boot camped once you've only been to one land and then shopify's boot camped every single time they've uh i don't know if they've actually been to like a land together but knowing that they've played in person together is a huge advantage when you're finally right. playing together in person but that's definitely the takeaways for me is just like getting those extra land reps, getting those extra boot camp reps, raising our skill floor and being like really hard and critical of ourselves during practice so we can like perform their best in, in tournaments for sure. So even after uh, last year's Berlin, you don't feel like G2 is 
feeling the exact same way as you guys are, especially after their win last year, where they should walk into a Game Changers tournament and and win on their worst day. So this is no hate to G2 Gozen. I have a, lo a lot of love for those girls in the roster. I met them in person. They're all amazing people. And I've looked up to some of the people on that team for years back in CS. The reality is, the as of today, pretty sure. Let me make sure my facts are right. As of today, the last co-ed event they played in, at least logged on VLR, was 14 months ago. So I don't really think that... Uh, just with that knowledge, I don't feel... I, I don't know. I don't see it, to be honest. And again, this is, all, like, this is the same thing as, like, four months ago was Berlin, right? So when we lost them in Berlin, they went 10 months without playing a co-ed tournament on VLR. So that's... I'm not saying I shouldn't be worried or anything, or, like, there's, there's going to be a breeze. But the reality is, like, when I view teams... I, I view Game Changers teams differently if they play co-ed versus when they don't. And this is a situation where I definitely view them differently. And in Berlin, I hold pretty truly to the fact that we beat ourselves. Um, okay. There was a lot of like internal things happening with the team. We had three coaches. There was too many. There was too much chefs. Too many chefs in the kitchen. There's just too many cooks. And there's a lot of things that led to us losing in uh, Berlin that I wouldn't really. I'm not saying take away the credit from the teams that beat us, but I really did feel like we lost to ourselves. And I think it was very clear that we were not performing at a level that we had performed at in open qualifiers and any of the other game changers. We looked like a completely different team. Berlin. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a, a, a nice revenge arc, if you call it that, I think. <laughs> um, but I, I also, I know that you've been following VCT Americas. We're going to talk about it in a bit. But the VCT Americas audience, I think, is about 150 people, isn't it? About 100 people? Is it yeah, less in, than that? In the, audience, uh, yeah. in, in the venue, yeah, it was like 150. I couldn't yeah. even get like tickets from my mom. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it, was it is sold out real quick. It's quite small and it sells out very quickly. But the reason that I bring that up is because I wondered if you'd seen Leo's tweet where they were talking about uh, the Game Changers uh, Championship in Sao Paulo and the fact that it's in such a small arena and that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of discuss your thoughts about the um, the announcements there, although it was what about a month ago at this point. I'm sure. You've got more uh, specific thoughts on it than, than we do, perhaps, and more relevant thoughts, too. And also Leo tweeting specifically that they um, are not trying to grow Game Changers particularly. They want the whole thing to flow into the co-ed tournaments, as you've been putting it. Um, but at the moment, that doesn't seem to really be happening. Like, just because you make it small, it doesn't actually seem to be incentivizing the Game Changers players to, to try out those bigger tournaments or to make teams of uh you know spe uh, specifically challenges teams either yeah i when i saw this tweet i obviously there was like the whole this whole drama right there's so much i think my teammate sarah responded to this and she was cooking not gonna lie but seeing this tweet <laughs> and seeing he's like you know we want you know gc players to be playing at masters and champs obviously but the reality is that there's a lot of issues that stand in the way of that that aren't even like related to skill and uh i don't I'm trying to think of how much I can like get into this. I could talk about this for hours, by the way. But like, there's a lot of things that go into you know women playing on GC team or uh, GC players, you know, playing on challengers and franchise teams one day that like I, like I said aren't related to, to skill at all. Like, there's been things where like even me personally that I can share with you guys that have gotten in my way of getting to that next level that were not related to my skill. I feel yeah. like it's only a matter of time before GC players even like get real opportunities and i think it's going to be happening soon but there's even stuff like on riots and that they could be doing more like i feel like like for me um i've had several like actual interests from teams from like top teams over my career um i, I can just name them like at this point it's kind of like old news and i'm on version right. one not on c9s anymore so i feel like I can, I can talk about it but like even just me just speaking for myself like i had interest from immortals back when they were like a top na team i had interest from knights when they were a top 10 na team in vct like closed uh 2022 and obviously KCP, which was like, I had a tweet longer about that. And there were like a couple other teams too that I can't really discuss right now because they are still involved in Valorant at a high level. Right. And these are things that like I had that were not like, they denied me because of my skill. They were like, okay, no, she's fucking bad. Women are bad at the game. <laughs> it was literally in every, all three scenarios, the reasons that I didn't join those teams were related to my org shutting down the conversation early because of my perceived value to partnership application process. Or it was a case where I trialed or was attempting to trial, but the buyout price ended the conversation immediately at the work level. Right. So, so the, those, it, there's th these things that aren't even related to me playing the game. It was completely out of my control whether or not I'd have the opportunities. Do you think those things are related to you being a Game Changers player in the sense that the brand value is much larger for... You know, if you're, if you're any kind of player that's trying to get into Kansas City Pioneers, let's say, 
then mm -hmm. probably uh, most of those players don't have as large a value to their current organization as you do because you're kind of the, the central point IGL of a Game Changers team, of which that's an incredibly important part of a team's branding. And you're also kind of well-known because you're at the top of that scene. It, it's, I don't know, what, what would the equivalent even be in a, in a, uh, in a non-Game Changers setting? Like some unbelievably goated uh, collegiate player or something that's just like uh, the big well, name on campus. I don't even understand like what the uh, what the comparison well, would be the in a non game changer setting. Content creator, like a massive content I guess, creator. Yeah. Yeah, like a massive content creator who's actually really decent and wants to start going uh, into professional play. So d did you uh is that kind of are we on the right track there that that seemed to be the the reason behind it? Like people holding on to you too tightly for your value to the game changer scene? I would say that is pretty accurate. That and like the buyout cost because salary, like I feel like I've seen people discuss this um, as well online is like, this isn't like a wild well, DC players only want salary. That's why they don't go to a challengers team. I have like told my agent, I will take the pay cut. I will take whatever pay cut I want to play on these teams. Um, but that's just not like something that has changed anything <laughs> really. It's just been like a matter of like, you know, Orgs holding a little tightly because of like, you know, perceived value to, um, at the time it was the partnership application, but even with the partnership application, it was like your value to the org, you bring eyes to the org, you bring XYZ yeah. to the org, you know, stuff like that. And also just like the buyout, which is just unfortunate. I know this isn't like exclusive to GC players, but because of that value, your buyout's going to be higher as a GC player, for sure. Especially if you're like top of GC and you're playing very well, you're going to have a bigger buyout than someone maybe like someone that might be grinding out in tier two that's a free agent. Like, think of it from, like, um, the teams that were reaching out to me. Think of it from their POV. Like, why would the org pick up a GC player, have to pay a buyout, maybe pay extra, maybe not, because I personally asked for, like, I'd take any salary cut necessary to be on these teams. Why would you do that when there's, like, a Tier 2 free agent that probably has similar stats, maybe isn't as, like, a, doesn't have, like, a bunch of tournament wins or anything like that, but why would you take that over this person, right? So it's kind of it's kind of hard, and I feel like at some point, maybe there needs to be more, like, incentives from Riot to incentivize teams and challengers to like pick up so, GC players. So when it comes to of, go ahead, go ahead. When it comes to that tweet then, the Leo tweet where he's saying they're not trying to grow game changers, you think he should take that a step further where they should not like you, you shouldn't grow game changers because we want to incentivize the pathway from game changers to to co ed. You think he yeah. should take that a step further. So for context switch before you answer the question right now, to my understanding the systems that Riot has in place for like to kind of give advantage or give uh, incentive for orgs to have game changers team is just that in qualifiers for events, you can have both your game changers and your like your main rosters, like the co-ed team playing right. at the same time. And, and I'm pretty sure that's the only thing well, right now, correct? And the thing for partnership where um, import. Import, import limit, count. yeah, you can break import limit with game changers players. Hmm. As it stands, those are the only two things that really incentivize teams to pick up GC players, but um, I mean, for the first one is just having an org, having a GC team rather than like uh, anything else. But I think, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to theorycraft ideas here. I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I just know that there could be like more done. But I think something that could be interesting would be like, as it stands now, there's a roster lock rule, right? For the split where you need to have three out of the five of your core in order to play. You can't make two out of five or something that um, during a split. And I think something interesting would be you can, you can get around that rule. You can get like two out of five if you pick up a game changers player, for example. Like you'd have to think of some That'd creative cool. ways. I'm not asking for things like, yo, let's have a game changers team, make it to challengers for free. Like, fuck no, please do not do that. I you, don't want that. Nobody you, wants that. You get that two five rule and you know, trick is going to go crazy on Mad Lions. hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. Oh my God. Yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? Because I saw a lot of the conversation really being about the fact of like, we want game change. You know, a lot of the people that really enjoy the game changes product of being like, we want it to grow larger because also the larger it is, the more it incentivizes other uh, people of marginalized genders to get involved with actually playing the game in a competitive sense. And that is one of the goals of game changes to start with. But it's really interesting. I never thought about it like that before, but the larger that game changes gets, the more difficult it is for the players to be able to escape from its orbit and go into playing <laughs> challenges. It, it's a really strange dynamic actually that i hadn't thought about yeah and, and super unique oh, go ahead go ahead yeah I, I was just gonna say like what do you think 
can help to change that? Because it feels like a lot of that is on the org level. Because it's like, for players like you and other top players, like your value as a Game Changers player is obviously huge. Because in a lot of ways, you've kind of, I feel like, become like the face of NA Game Changers and the person that a lot of people affiliate with that. And in that, like obviously Cloud9 didn't want to let you go because they thought you were too valuable. But for players like you, or, or you were talking about Fluorescent saying that she's like, could be like the best player in the world and is someone who can compete at like a top level on teams outside of game changers. Like, what do you think incentives can be put in place to actually get, uh, get not only organizations, but also maybe in a way riot to be able to like get more of those players out of the way? Do you think it's something that's more on the org level or something that's more on like riot should be setting incentives or just in the way that like players agents are negotiating contracts or something? I think it'd be a combination of all three. I think it's a good point. I think obviously Riot could have more incentives, like something creative, like what I just thought about. I think if you really delve into it, you could probably, I'm fucking stupid. You could probably think of something better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. I'm an ideal for a fucking Valorant team. Like how, how smart can I be? But uh, I think orgs can also do better in terms of like good faith, you know, knowing that like, okay, you might lose this player, but the, how do I say, like the positives for the scene this would be if a woman were to play on these teams outweighs the potential profit you could make off of them would be like a, you know, a, a nice first step idea. But also from Riot, I think there could be like something brought up maybe with the players union where Riot, um, when it comes to teams that have GC team or or that have GC teams, making it so that um, they kind of not enforce. I'm not sure how exactly this would be, would be enforced, but making it so these orgs are having good faith negotiations and um, kind of trending positively for the players in terms of like less holding on to them and more like letting them explore co-ed options if that's something they want to do. And I can say just, just to clear up any air, like version one is very, very nice to me and my team. We have some nice stuff in our contracts that allows us to explore our options in terms of co-ed. So that's not something I'm going to be dealing with this year, I hope. But right. I think that would be like a good start where orgs are having better like uh, good faith negotiations and maybe Riot is kind of enforcing that and being like, hey, like we want GC players to make this jump. We understand that it's not a skill issue at this point, even though like I go on Reddit and these people are like, um, this tier four player is not ready. And they don't even know how our scrims are going. They don't even know that we're a scrimming partner team. They don't even know we're a scrimming challenger team. They don't know that we're winning some of these scrims. You know what I mean? It's, it's not a skill issue. I promise you it's not a skill issue. Yeah. I think, I think you could take anyone from my team, any role, and you could put them in a challenger team and they would perform uh, about equal or if not the if not better than some of their counterparts. I'm not saying that every challengers team, I'm not saying you fucking put me on M80 and I'm gonna be out calling John, John QD like instantly, you know what I mean? Or something like that. But I think certain challengers teams, you could honestly make that switch and it would be very beneficial. And I could see that it wouldn't be a flop. 100 Do you think that level of play in Game Changers is somewhat universal? Or do you think that's something that's more around like your team and some of the players you played with on the past with, with Cloud9? Because I think you have a unique perspective because the scrims and the behind the scenes stuff you're seeing has always been with your squad, who has always been at the, the very top of Game Changers. You were saying, talking about how there's like kind of a tier gap between you and Shopify and then like a tier gap between everyone else. Are you seeing that same like level of talent or like, I guess, readiness of, of players elsewhere in the NA scene to start to make that leap? Do you think that's still um a barrier i think this also kind of goes back to the points you were making about teams not playing in co-ed even just as a full game changers team uh, i don't think so yet i think it is pretty much only related to like uh former cloud night white members and like my team to be honest i think i don't know if that's controversial to say now that i say it out loud um i think it's just like the reality is like you said um there's just not enough teams even playing in co-ed for me to even make that judgment because as of right now like how i would base my judgment would be what teams are playing very well in co-ed and it's not there's like two <laughs> it's us and like x set let's be real <laughs> shopify didn't even play in the first open qualifier it's like uh and it's not a coincidence that those also happen to have x cloud night white players on it that's just like always been our motto and our mantra and it really is only like uh us x set i think complexity plays in a couple of the uh open qualifier not open qualifiers the uh, open co-ed events as well so unfortunate but i think it is kind of sustained only to that group but i'm not to say that it can't get bigger like it would gen genuinely be as simple as these teams playing in co-ed tournaments and proving to me and proving to everyone else that they can hang in like tier three like that's it i mean i, I heard you know during the break when all of our mics were obviously turned off that fluorescent is going to be subbing in for sentinels you know so that that should be oh, a huge... wow so we're leaking now okay yeah that should be a huge opportunity so i mean yeah. that's 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 fun so yeah, listen we'll, we'll get to see whether she really is the best player in the world and she'll be <laughs> oh she'll be instantly judged on one match and against loud and if she fails she's trash the same way that people judge the rest of sentinels
That would be uh, insane, though. Holy shit. Shall we talk about Americas then? I know you've been keeping up with it, Mel. So I wanted to begin, obviously, with this insane Sentinels uh, situation. Um, they've announced, Kaplan did a video where he was talking about the fact that he is now the head coach and they're going to bench tens temporarily. That's ostensibly temporarily because he has COVID, because he has um, an infection on his finger that's making it difficult to play. Um, and they're going to bring in Marv, who is a sixth player who's just got a visa. Now, before we even get to any of that shit, I want to start talking about the, the psycho being dropped and Kaplan coming in as head coach kind of situation. Because I'm very confused. I want to start right there. I'm confused. I don't get it. I don't see how any of the changes that they're going to be making heading into the future are going to be or would have been impeded by Don continuing as the head coach. Don literally formed this squad and the coaching staff because he has a strong working relationship with Kaplan as a strategy and with Drew doing analyst work as well. It's, you know, I don't understand what Psycho would be blocking to stop this team getting better. It's not like Psycho is forcing Sassy to play smokes, surely. What does this actually improve changing the coaching staff? It feels like I, I, so for context, in some of the tweets that we saw below this, and for those of you that don't know, Kaplan was already heading up the majority of like strategy for this team. He's been the strategic coach since the beginning. He's been on Sentinels the whole time. And uh, Psycho Don has talked about that he built the team intentionally to have this team of coaching staff that would kind of complement each other and help build up this team. And now looking at it at this point, if it's been Kaplan for the most part already making a lot of the strategic decisions and that's already been the place he's in. I'm with you, Josh, in that it's like, what was he blocking? It almost feels like for dropping him at this point, if he was just kind of an additive part of that team, will not significantly change anything unless behind the scenes maybe he was blocking some ideas or or pushing more of his own ideas into the team than we're kind of being led on to. But I somehow doubt that. And it feels more like it might just kind of be like, okay, we had really high expectations. We've been getting shit on this far. We're paying this guy a bunch of money. We should scrape out someone and just get him out of here. I mean, yeah, it I mean, really does feel like he's the, been the fall guy for this. Yeah, it definitely could be. I, I mean, the only theories that come to mind when you're thinking of like, oh, potentially blocking somebody are what obviously has transpired now that he is uh, gone, right? It, which is... Tens taking a little bit of a break and bringing in Mark. That's the only thing that is obvious. But also, Mark that... didn't even have a visa before this, did he? Well, he was, he was working on it. He was working on it as a member of the inactive roster. He was working on getting that visa. Yes, right. But, but it's you, not like you're... Don. It's not like Don was in the visa office saying, "Decline this I mean, guy's visa. I don't want to play." Hey, hey, it's the only thing we can point to. So I mean, it must be right. Like it must be. Um, it's just strange too, because I also I'm pretty sure in the most recent rule set for uh, Americas and for the international leagues, I'm pretty sure that both assistant coaches and coaches can talk during timeout. So I think both of their input would have already been added. Like I don't think this is even a thing where it's like okay, we get rid of him. I, I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure certain. No, because it's like correct as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that is if correct. you get rid of him, you already had all of the you already what? had both those voices in the timeouts. You're not really changing anything by just eliminating one. Is, is that a change or 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 what? Because because that's not how it's been working. That's yeah. Yeah. It must have been a change. Because I at Berlin, because we had three coaches, and maybe I can kind of relate to the situation at Sentinels, where they have like, you know, they have an analyst, they have an assistant coach, and they have a head coach. On C9, we had three coaches. There wasn't as much of a hierarchy as there is on Sentinels, but I think it could very well be like what you guys were discussing in terms of this might have been like maybe behind the scenes he was like interjecting, or like they, maybe there's just too much cooks in the kitchen. Like Kaplan wanted it this way, and this person wanted it this way. Obviously, we can only speculate, but. I feel like with how it's been announced, it definitely seems to trend that way. I, I feel like I find it hard to believe that players would just scapegoat him, especially when they have like former exit players without like any like rhyme or reason to it. It feels oh, like. I'm not I'm not saying the players would have done it. I'm saying management oh, no, for would sure. have done it personally. I mean, I mean especially I, I, the way that it was announced, probably. Because it was like yeah. announced on like Rob Moore's like personal Twitter, which it, always it gets feels a little bit weird. Which, by the way, we were talking to Don earlier in the day and he did not give any indication that he knew that this was coming either. I oh, mean, his, you know, his wife and his kid were in the audience too for that game. And they lost the game much closer than we thought they would play it. And they could have 2 0 it genuinely had they won the OT on the split. So a, a bonkers kind of situation there. And to be fair as well, like if if it was like an idea of, okay, Kaplan wants to be the only voice in the coach kind of timeout, so the players want that to be the case, then they probably would have just said, hey, can you just jam 
like because <laughs> you're the guy who's building the team why 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 not just let you, me do you, this you see and... that in his like announcement post that he's leaving he's like i'm open to positions gming doing anything like yeah. i feel like he would have been comfortable switching over to that position being like okay kaplan's already taking up a lot of the strategy it makes sense for him to be the guy to call adaptations and, and i'm honestly surprised that that's not how they started to be honest because kaplan already has head coach experience and he has a high level experience with the game not that don doesn't either because he's obviously coached except but kaplan has literally played like uh, on high level teams before so um I don't know that that to me seems like the more obvious solution if it was player or coach decisions or whatever do do you think let, let's just look at this from you know rob moore or management's perspective do you think the panic button needed to be pressed for sentinels at this point oh no come i mean they're what one and two they almost beat leviathan here they could have two of them like it very much could have been the case no, it feels so on, reactionary because it's like you lose the one map in overtime to go to map three. And like the, their pearl wasn't very good, but you're playing Leviathan, who I think have the best pearl in the league. Their read was a little off. The KO idea didn't really work out for them. But I, I don't feel like that series was a tragedy in any way. Tens was fucking like sick. He had a, he had COVID. He had an infection at the same time. Like a lot was going wrong to like build against him winning that game. And they still almost beat Leviathan, who's like a top three team in the league. Yeah, I, I just guess I'm coming from it from the perspective of, of I haven't liked what I've seen from Sentinels. I thought that the game against Leviathan, yes, it was close, but I, I thought that the the major things that they improved were their pistol rounds and their early round game plan, but they still looked uncomfortable in the roles swaps that have happened. Sure. And I don't see that. I mean, that is going to get better over time, surely, except now it's not because they've gone back to their old stuff. But, you know, had they stuck to it, it would have got better over time. But they're... Their, um, their, their defensive protocols, their mid-rounding on the attack side still looked really shoddy. And I think that they were able to get a lot of their value there just by doing some pistol round work and hard anteing um, and making sure that they fixed up the sloppy mistakes that they were making in the first like 20, 30 seconds of the round, uh, not giving away free picks. But do I think that Sentinels would have been able to make Tokyo with sassy playing smokes and the current setup i don't i i mean i don't think so like you said i mean it's a surface level change and even if the panic button is hit like it's not it's not changing anything right like <laughs> well do, do you think well here's the other part do you agree that this is going to yes. be a temporary change oh the tense thing of course yeah 100 percent. no for sure so even you think even tense, if they I find think... a bunch of success with it while he's out uh I mean, You're confident that this is going to be a temporary change, even if they, they start winning their game. Uh, yeah, look, that's what Cap they said. Cap Don't Cap give me that's hey, what they said. Oh, oh, oh. Kaplan oh, did not have a corporation said Cap it. So I'll Cap believe Kaplan it. did not have a good. The fucking Rob Moore wasn't sitting next to him. Okay, I mean he might have been off camera. <laughs> did but did like... you see the video? Rob Moore had a fucking gun to his head. He said, <laughs> he said, Kaplan, swear every other sentence so we can get our edgy fan base on board. Oh my god, dude, a hundred percent. Kaplan's saying we're gonna work really fucking hard like i've talked to kaplan kaplan is not like edgy sentinels person like that that was so scripted the way that he was talking there it's so corpo it's like deliberately yeah. zuma but but I, mm. again again what are you what what are, what are they getting at by replacing uh, tens with with mard like ten, tens again they get sassy on initiator. Exactly. Okay. I don't see that tends to being the problem. I, yeah. I watched the games and it, it seems more like macro game plan oriented, both attack on defense. They have like all the right pieces. Like I watched their games and it's like tens will actually make the best play in a world possible. Like he's walling off be heaven. There was a noise cut. They can only go A and the A players are all heaven. No one's turtling into sight. No one's getting into sight, setting up crossfires. They play retake. Leviathan has, uh, Leviathan has Viper rolled. They hit the site and they just ult the site. Like, it seems like way more macro. Like, even like on Ascent, like, I can't even like attribute any of the losses to Tens. Like, you look at Ascent, Tens is playing retake with an op every round because yeah, instead all of, the time. bro, it was making me so mad. Bro, Tens is floating, he goes B, and instead of the Killjoy or the Sova anchoring B, they both rotate. How does the KJ and the Sova both rotate from B and leave Tens to op a line when he yeah. should just be rotating with the op? It's just like but absurd. I don't, I don't they, see the game plans. I think they have the right players, but the game plans make no sense sometimes. I think maybe part of the improvement, though, will come from having... So when you watch Tens operate around the map, often he's um, alone at the beginning of these rounds and not being set up to do something mm -hmm. as part of the, the team. And I think 
possibly Zekin will end up being a bit more decisive about that because when he was playing with Exet, he was when he was playing the entry, he was getting loaded with uh, help and he was the main focal tip of what was going on. And I think that if Zekin's confident enough to be able to, you know, come for a lot of that additional help, it might make a big difference in terms of the value that they get because at the moment, it just feels like they've told Tens to be on a bit of an island and it's just like, yeah, get whatever value you can, but it's not like yeah. the... It's not like their defense-sided systems work around always having him being in, in great spots. I mean, he's either holding hands with Zekin all the time anyway when they're playing, or he's doing the same thing every round. Like, he was always playing B-Heaven when he was playing Sage. I don't think he moved anywhere else. He never had, like, a wall B-Main or a wall A-Main or, you know, playing up in a different position. or You know, it was always just the same kind of spots, and it comes down to, is he with Zekin or is he alone? And I think that... It's not like it's not like that's necessarily on tens, obviously, to adjust their entire game plan and say, "Hey, this doesn't make too much sense." But I think well, mixing things up probably will allow Zekin to do that more. Zekin is definitely a lot, probably more assertive, but I, I don't think I've seen I'm more that. experienced. Uh, I mean. He is at the top level. He really is. I mean, he's played with much better systems than Tens has. Tens is the kind of player where you want to teach him how to play in a really good system because he's played on yeah. some shite I mean, systems. They've talked before. about how like how a lot of this team was about like reteaching him and like him like kind of regaining the drive and having to get him used to the new system. Like I think that's a very valid point. Whereas I think the maps where Zekin has played duelists with this team, or even the double duelist ones, it has seemed like they they've been a lot more proactive. And this is obviously kind of like digging a little bit deeper into like comms and stuff that we don't hear. But from like his time on Exit, he was always that guy who's super proactive, kind of what you were talking about with Floor, um, where he's very willing to call for his own utility, call for setups, like set himself up for success with his teammates. I don't, obviously we can't hear the comms, but we don't, I didn't seem like they were having that with Hens in the same way. It seems like it was just like something was being called, he's going to go sit in the same spot. I wonder if it's a part of it being like Tens doesn't want to be like an inconvenience. Something as simple as like he doesn't want to ask for this because he doesn't want to like fuck with the system. As simple as like, yeah, hey, Pankata, instead of starting like CT, can you come break my dart and mark it? Or it's like instead of, uh, you know, him holding the B line when two of his teammates that should be angry B are rotating, instead of being like, all right, yeah, I'll hold this B line. Like, yo, let me rotate. I have op. Like, I don't want to play retake with op. Like, stuff like that, maybe he doesn't want to mm -hmm. say because maybe he might be like unironically too nice. Like, he just doesn't want to mess with the system they have already, which the, this the is other, also already like, a team that has a lot of voices in it like def is an igl he's talked about how like players like zekin will add stuff in saucy was doing a lot of like secondary igling on loud and to my understanding he's doing some of that on this team as well like there's already a lot of people like adding input that i, I could see that being a possibility the, the the other part of that too is is tens really going to want to mess with a system and ask for help from people who are learning and adjusting to new roles anyway i think it's going to be easier for zekin because he's got saucy on an easier role now you know he doesn't have to um, if, if you're trying to ask Pankada and, and um, Sassy to do stuff while Sassy's playing Omen and Pankada's playing uh, Sentinel, they're, they're still adjusting to their roles. You can see in terms of the way that uh, Sassy's had some big moments because he's still a great player, but the way in which he uses his utility is not like he's a natural smokes player. He's still getting adjusted to it. And for Pankada, I feel like we haven't seen very many of those incredible moments because he just can't be as mobile and outplay people with his brain, which he was doing a ton of back when he was playing Smokes. So if Pancada stays on Sentinel, maybe he'll still be putting in just like those, you know, solid, decent performances. But I think the improvement from Sassy and the way that he plays will be astronomical. I don't know why, but people seem to have forgotten that he was like arguably the best initiator in the world and uh, the kind of player that never made a wrong move. Like, never. He was always in exactly the position to win his team rounds. And that did mean that he was much safer than a player like Zekin. Zekin plays a lot more aggressive. You see the hero plays and stuff like that coming out of him. Um, but Sassy is going to be rock solid for this team on Initiator. And I think that's going to make things a lot easier for them. Yeah. But, again, brings it back to the whole idea that, like... Uh, this has been my problem from the beginning with Sentinels is that there's too many problems at the same time that they're trying to cover. And this is, uh, maybe it's going to help alleviate some of them, but at the same time too, you're adding a shit ton of turmoil to the team when they're already dealing with, you know, the dealing with a sick player. They're not sure whether he's going to be coming back. Uh, and then dealing with role changes, dealing with adding a whole new person, dealing with in introducing 
new language, um, as comms for players, like all of those things matter so, 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 so much. And when you combine them, like it's just, there's just too much to deal with. So I, to bring it back to the whole Don thing, I think it's just absolutely absurd to do something that drastic, especially when it probably didn't have, like it, it, it probably number one, didn't even need to like happen super, super, super publicly. Um, there could have just been something in the background where there's not somebody getting freaking fired in the middle of a se after th week three. And um, it probably also just isn't changing anything anyways, like in the comms. That's my opinion. Do you think Marv had any idea he was actually going to be required to play when he signed that contract? <laughs> yeah. Think, you think? Yeah. I think he thought he was getting a nice little streaming bag. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I feel like he thought that, but also like... If he you play, if you to. have to come in and play like two matches, I feel like that's pretty chill. You don't have to like, f I don't know if they're making him full time move to LA. That sucks if that's the case, but I don't know. Dude, I, feel I like I, he'll just he'll kind of vibe with it. Marv wanted a break, and I'm pretty sure he wanted to come back eventually, right? Like it's not oh, like he was I would assume so. So like I'm sure I'm sure he's fiending to get back into these games now that America's has started, right? <laughs> Probably if it, yeah, I mean most people with competitive drive really do end up like missing it when they're gone um I, I, we haven't i haven't exactly asked the question in as many words but i think you've kind of intimated as much bala do you think this is going to make them better mm, no no do you mean for the week coming up do you yeah think there's just too many issues yeah there's too many too well yeah no there's too many things going on i don't think they'll uh, they're playing loud and who like mibr yeah i mean <laughs> On top of that, you have the pressure from on the, the two Brazilians, which might be really good to beat their their the people who they've never lost to. So I it could know. benefit from a more pugged out system though in their matches. If we were talking about like tens not wanting to interrupt the system, and now they're bringing in Marvs and people are going back to roles yeah. they haven't played in a couple of weeks, maybe they're just like fuck it, we just start pugging it out, and then you need those like comms that maybe don't come out as much when you have a structure because things are presumed that yeah. might actually help them, you know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, that is talking. always a little buff when teams can can. <laughs> no just start expectations pugging. and pugginess <laughs> are the ultimate fucking buff. Dude. I also think like playing loud first to kind of get a game where there isn't expectations of you winning. It might actually be kind of nice for them because you get that match. They will probably lose it. They end up losing it. Then you can learn from that. You have another kind of like what like four days to go back and prep for MIBR and and fix things up with this new roster. It's not like they're making a substitution for like one match that they're really expected to win, there's a lot of pressure, and then it's immediately switching back to tens or something like that. Like, this feels like if there was going to be a swap like this, this is kind of the best time. Except that they're coming into Super Week and there's two games happening this week. Uh, yeah, but don't you have, like, one. a few days off after the loud match before you play MIBR? Oh, it's only two. I thought it was longer. Yeah, that's it's a little It's not long, a large but... amount of time. And also, they're winning... Oh, sorry, they win. They're, they're the close loss to Leviathan. Look, look at me, uh, coping already, <laughs> rewriting re history. Um, their close loss, I think, and the map win that they got on Ascent was largely powered by doing a lot of good anteing of, uh, of what they were doing. I mean, the first pistol round, on, in fact, a lot of the pistol oh, yeah. rounds that Sentinels won was like a hard ante of Leviathan's normal pistol round attacking strat, where Def gets two of them just fully expecting that pathing over towards heaven. Um, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to... I mean, what do you do? Just give up on the loud game and hard anti MIBR because they're the more easily won a, uh, winnable game. I mean, that's probably the the best option when you look at things, but there's no way they're going to do that. Um, so I think it's going to be very tough. Uh, if it was the management that called this panic button, are they going to be panicking more if they go 0-2 and two in Super Week? Is it just absolute turmoil? Well, I mean, at that point, their expectations are shot, right? Like, it's going to be... <laughs> If the expectation for them is to make Tokyo and they go zero and two in Super Week, then there's no chances of getting to Tokyo. Then like, there's nothing there, to panic about is. at that point. It's fucking there, fire. There still is actually though. That's the mad part. Even if Sentinels go zero and two here and they're one and four, if they win, that so that means they would still have yet to play Cloud Nine, EG, and Crew, all winnable games. So there is still a chance, even if they go one and four here, that they end three and five. Uh, sorry. No, I've, I've messed up there, haven't I? They go four and five, sorry. If they win against Cloud9, EG, and Crew, they'd be four and five. They'd yeah. probably get into that sixth spot, and then it's True. just about winning in playoffs. True. But but what else can you do? Like, what, what, other, what other panic is there to do? Like, there's nothing Head else coach to Drew? do. 
<laughs> I mean, just keep moving down the line. Yeah. Head coach tens, fuck it. Like <laughs> bring in Shroud to coach. Like He'll bring they... Shroud in if they go 0 and 2 this week. <laughs> They'll run it back. Yeah. Wild wild scenes. Wild scenes. Alright, so let's let's move on to another team that's having an absolute <laughs> Nightmare scenario at the moment. But, I mean, actually getting a win, so uh, it can't be that much of a nightmare. Was BCJ really the problem with EG? Should we, I mean, should we blame all of their problems on BCJ and the reason that they won was all to do with Dima Wong coming in? That's a serious question. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Uh, The answer is no. No. Come on now. The answer is no. I think think they played... I mean, I don't even necessarily think that they played better than the past. I think Crew is just not as good of a team as I even thought. And Dude, uh, I really expected Crew to win this game. Same, same, absolutely. Um, just, just based off of the, th- uh, if you watch the first two games from EG and you watch the lock-in games, you could tell BCJ was performing perfectly fine. Maybe, maybe, I, I don't know. BCJ is a really nice guy. I can't imagine that he has problems with anybody inside of that team when yeah. the team was built up by being like this super nice family team that like everybody gets to, gets along together. Like I thought BCJ would fit perfectly in that. So, I mean, maybe my read is wrong, but uh, that's the only way he could have been a problem in my mind. I mean, when you look at the compositions that, that they were playing, it seems like BCJ ended up having to sit because they wanted to keep Jorgamo in the squad for presumably like firepower reasons, I would imagine. Because Bustio and Jorgamo ended up playing the smokes kind of stuff that BCJ would have been playing. Um, I mean, that's even that's even without the whole question of what I think makes way more sense, which is but BCJ to go back to playing initiator and for them to um, to to have Com sit the bench. But Com actually played better this week than he had done previously too. Yeah, I, I feel like though a lot of like what we're saying also just has to be put in context of like I agree with you, Bella. I feel like they looked pretty similar. Like they were they were playing crew. It was still incredibly scrappy. Like I let's give credit to Demon One because he came in. He played like three completely different roles across the series <laughs> and individual. I mean, it's fucking uh, crazy that they have crazy. this guy and Brim Killjoy and Jet. He played uh, really well on all of them. Like just as an individual player. Like credit to Demon for being able to step in and do that. But. Does this does the win here give me long term hopium for EG? Absolutely not. It was the ninth place versus tenth place matchup in Americas. There are so many really really good teams in this league, and I don't think that this that BCG going out will solve all their problems. I don't think Demon One is the savior of EG. I think they're still going to show same issues that they were showing when they do have to face off against the stronger teams that they are yet to play. By the way, first time that a North American team has beaten a uh, LATAM or Brazilian team. Let's go, America. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> what has yeah, Demon 1 been up to? Like, the, the secondary roster for EG, what have they even been up to? They don't even have a fifth, right? So what has Demon 1 even been doing this whole time? They've just been sitting in a custom? Are they even been scrimming? They can't scrim unless they have I mean, five, right? Unless I don't they have, have insider five. info, but, like, is that... Do you know, like, is that roster <laughs> I scrimming? Don't, I don't even know. I scrimmed them a couple months ago, but they stopped scrimming. You know what, the whole adder thing, I, I haven't seen them scrim since. So I'm just wondering, like, what has Demon One been think, cooking this whole time? I think time? they're scrimming still. I don't know with who. With but who? I, with what? I, I don't know. No fifth I mean, sign for four months. Like, I, what? I mean, how is he even playing like this, considering the situation? I don't understand. Yeah. I mean, do I, they there's... just have BCJ scrimming with that roster then? If it's... oh my god, I don't know. I didn't even think about that. Wait, I need to check my friends list. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the. I, I, I don't even know what to say about... The, okay, here's where, here's where I want to go with this. Crew had a close game against MIBR. Very, very close game. Um, it looked like they were both on about the same tier as each other. Split by a hair. MIBR goes on to beat EG. Crew goes on... Sorry. MIBR goes on to beat NRG. Crew goes on to lose to EG. What the fuck is happening in the Americas League? <laughs> That's my question. Legitimately, how can you predict games or do power rankings or anything for a region in which that's the case? Someone make it make sense. Is it because MIBR and crew are so familiar with each other? I'm not even sure they would be at that point. That just seems like a bit of, you know, a bit of a cop-out. 
Um, well, what's going on here? Are MIBR I, just going to be a very inconsistent team uh, that have crazy highs and, and yes. pretty bad lows? That's where I was going to go with it. I think that MIBR is a bit more of a fluctuating team. Given what we saw at Lock-In, they looked really abysmal there. And then they come into the first two weeks of America's and look okay. Um, but I think against Crew, they they were not playing their best. Um, they were they were just not. They had to they had to have multiple comebacks in that series um, to even stay alive in it like crew had was in the driving seat if i remember correctly for most of that so um on top of that i also think that crew are now hitting the point where they're getting worse because of kesnet being in the team like if you watch this this series and compare it to, to the rest of them kesnet was just like going crazy in this series and forcing his team to like do a lot of catching up to him because of how aggressive he was playing and he i went think that one is... and 11 on attack side jet on ascent that was something i've never seen before from kesner yeah um uh yeah so but if you watch like pearl and you watch uh, even fracture for example fracture was this Ray's game and that wasn't that great but pearl specifically like the dude was inting into back site for example and his team had to rush to catch up to him or that was not happening on a, 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 in the mibr game so like they've had a play style shift because of the way that kesner's playing i don't know why but this was always what I was really scared of with Kesnick coming back into this roster was forcing a, a difference back to the old crew in comparison to where they wanted to go with Melzer coming in the team, with Davies coming in the team, with having new blood in the team entirely. It's a bizarre situation. I d I, yeah, I mean, just a very fitting game for the toilet bowl of America's. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it, it was, though. It was like a 9-3 lead on the first map that got thrown away. All of EG's games before this, EG were in the lead and then just tossed it massively. And then this game, they're down 9-3, win, up 8-4, lose, and then fracture. I mean, <laughs> it was like just a... It was a whirlwind. It was a very, very bizarre also, game. Uh, did, I, it wasn't did, even I the worst game this. so far, by the way. But <laughs> the Pearl game, the way that they, they're like... Reed was so interesting on this like no duelist double controller comp that they're playing because they're like okay we're just gonna get judge and orb every round and then once he throws his wall we are just gonna have him int the hardest he possibly can to probably get two kills and then die and then guess what we just have a reckoning every two rounds like it was deranged because it was ridiculous I mean, but it kind of worked he's just like, swinging inside his cove yeah. though like he's just turned his cove into a thunderdome <laughs> and then just trying to 1v1 people inside yeah, of it oh my god i think of the round like back b where jojmo ran like fucking 50 feet in front of his team and then he gets one kill swings into like towards secret someone's in front of him he has a cove in hand he throws the cove down the crew member utterly whiffs on him they both run into the cove <laughs> jojmo kills him runs back out kills another guy like it was ridiculous. That's why BCJ's on the bench for those kind of plays. BCJ can't <laughs> be doing those kind of plays. That's true. That's, that's a Jorkamo only class. Also, like, Jojimo playing, like, the roles still don't make sense. Like, when Jojimo played Ray's, it was really good. He's really good at that role. But we have him, like, flexing onto Harbor. It's just, Ichi's still doing such weird things that it feels like they're trying to, like, run before they can walk. And, like, they got this win over Crew, and that's cool. But, yeah, ugh, I don't know what to think about this. Yeah, I... Uh, People were asking me if EG were going to go winless. I said, no, they'll probably be able to get one win. I think this is it. I think, uh, yeah. But I don't know. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll see some more crazy shenanigans happening. Um, th this team is the only uh, North American team, though, that's been able to beat one of the LATAM and Brazilian teams. I said that earlier. But uh, one of the teams that hasn't had an opportunity yet that maybe is the last hope for North America is Cloud9. They actually look good. Like, this team is looking decent. And they came out here with a devastating loss to 100 Thieves. But it was a, a pretty good performance from this Cloud9 squad, no? Uh, they, they won. I was going to say, did they win versus 100 Thieves? Sorry, what, sorry, what I meant was a devastating <laughs> loss 400 Thieves. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I phrased it very poorly there. But yeah, a devastating loss 400 Thieves in this game. But Cloud9 came out and I think they looked very strong. But my, my point kind of being that it wasn't just 100 Thieves falling to pieces, although yeah. it does feel like that. 100 Thieves definitely look really poor. But it was also a good performance from Cloud9, I thought. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, man. 
Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, I think the thing that impressed me the most on this map was both of their defensive sides and their calling uh, against Hunter Thieves was just really good. They, like, consistently had the right stack to site, it, stack to site, site to stack in late rounds on both of these maps. And I think a big part of that was, like, how well they were using Zeppa's initiator utility in the mid round uh, across both games. Like, on Lotus, like, his late round flashes and the fast pivots that he and Leaf would do across the map to have the right setup in late rounds was so good it felt like they were out calling hundred thieves and having just better information across that map and then on ascent they had like rounds where they had a couple like cool ko knives that would like delay land across the map you'd get information off that you then know that you can stack towards the other side and win that out for hundred thieves like i don't think it was horrid from them but they definitely just got outclassed across both of their sides where they were trying to attack and for c9 like that's so impressive to me because i feel like the coordination for this team is it above? Is it a level so far above what I expected with the amount of practice that they had? I think for Rooney, this was such a dream situation for an IGL. I can speak from being an IGL here. Is that 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 like core of Cloud Nine? From what I've heard, because we have scrimmed against Cloud Nine Blue, I've worked with the old Cloud Nine Blue co uh, coaches back on C9 White. Is like that core of Zeppa, Leaf, and uh, and Zelsis. Um, Zelsis obviously new, but regardless, are so vocal. They are such vocal and mid roundy players that as an IGL, like this is the legit best case scenario for someone like Rooney. It's so yeah. much better to go into a, a system that has like really vocal players that can like really put some off, like get some weight off of you in like the mid round and like even like the server time aspect of things. Cause I know they used to play really loose, but having like that core of players be your three and you're the IGL like that's coming from like, um, from like the bottom like lower like tiers of valorant is so fucking helpful and it's it's so obvious when i watch these games because i can like i can like see the vocality of all the players and like everyone buying into also what rooney is calling like that has to be a godsend like i would love to be in rooney's position to be honest with these players yeah the the performance out of leaf on duelist is also nasty good i know he's talked about before that he doesn't like playing the duelist that much <laughs> But holy shit, he's fucking insane. do it. Don't care. Just fucking do it at this point. <laughs> he's no. insane. I mean, he goes plus nine in first kill to first deaths. Rooney was plus six too, which I don't even know how Rooney on his role is taking that many first duels, to be honest. But the the way in which Cloud9 look like they're playing is it's lights out, and it also like part of me is sad watching them because I keep thinking what this team could have been with yay and vanity on the team too but you know you shouldn't um i i guess i shouldn't assume that they would actually look this coordinated with that squad i think they would but they look like they have very good ideas of their approaches i'm just so impressed with mc's coaching every time i watch them i think yep. they also get like a buff from like Back when they played Red Bull, you guys know like the whole narrative of them being like a super team and being able to like shed that label is actually a huge buff. When now they mm. went from like a super team, like everyone had so much pressure on them, even though MC was in an interview saying, we don't even have best in role players. Stop calling us a super team, please. Like yeah. he's just hoping that people stop calling them a super team to actually being like beginning of the split. No one had any expectations. It could not get less expectations than this other than like EG. Like that is actually a huge buff when you don't have expectations and you're bringing in people. It's like, you feel like you can do no wrong, to be honest. Like what's the worst that can happen? You lose, that's what you're expected to do anyway. And having that yeah. is actually a huge buff. And now what's crazy too, is they play NRG this week. And if they beat NRG, no, I think no. then the community narrative is like, <laughs> this is the best NA team. Like, I think it's fair to say that like, they could be NA's last hope because uh, obviously they've played 100 Thieves in EG and they took a map off loud and lost. So the prep on the loud game to win the one map is really good. The rest of the series just wasn't there to the level of loud thus far. But I mean, if they continue on this momentum, I think that that NRG series is actually going to be really, really close. And if they can manage to win that, obviously NRG, I think, is still pretty far favored. Like there's a real discussion of like this Cloud9 roster was a real success with the players they picked up and like actually are like NA's best chance. That would be insane. Yeah, that would be pretty ridiculous. I mean, probably won't happen, I, but like I, also, it's not. I, I do think it's closer though than it ever should be, right? Like, yes. in terms of where Cloud9 were at the beginning of the year, I feel like a fucking broken record every time I talk about Cloud9 because, and I feel like at some point the players are going to get annoyed about it. Like, us all talking, like, no one was expecting them to do anything and now they're popping the fuck off. It's like, 
<laughs> it's crazy, though, every time I think about it, how badly they fucked themselves up, the organization, and yet they've still managed to bail themselves out. It is ludicrous. However, I wanted to talk about something different. Mimi, you said earlier, it's not like 100 Thieves played awfully. I think this was an abominable performance. Abominable. <laughs> like the snowman from 100 Thieves. What the fuck are they doing playing a solo smoke comp on Lotus? Uh, they have never understood how to play that map, and that continues to this day again. And also, what was I watching on 100 Thieves Attack side? What am I witnessing? They're, 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 they're so uncoordinated, so unconfident. Cryo looks like a different player. It's like watching Scream play. It's just... They're burning all of their utility and then trying to walk into the A site when there's a double setup on, on Ascent. It's so, so poor. No? No, I, I, I was, I was right. watching it. Uh, right. And I feel like the... I feel like 100 Thieves doesn't have the best read on what is very good on Lotus, even just from a comp perspective, because the way I see it is that Lotus is like the most attack sided right now and like the least defense yeah. sided in the pool. Like by far, the stats show that as well. But just pure, for like a pure gameplay perspective, you see people running double controller, not just for the attack prowess, but mostly for defense. You see Cloud9 like completely shutting down sites. If you try to go to C early, you're getting mollied. If you try to go a second time, there's a KJ molly. If you go B, there's a KJ molly. Like there's usually a lot of stopping points in the round, but Usually when you're playing these maps which are which are very attack or defense sided, you want to run a comp that is like that like uh helps the side that's weaker. So you'll see teams that like run double controller because defense side is so weak to try and make defense more winnable than it is right now. So it makes no sense to me what comp 100 Thieves is running because it's it's a very attack sided map by default. No matter you could run any comp and you'd get more rounds on attack than on defense. And it's like their comp seems to be attack sided, but then when I see them actually hit sites which should be like favored for them because they have the breach. Aston is like running in completely untradeable, like no util being used. And then you watch how C9 plays the map and it's like they're actually completing their defaults. Like 100 Thieves will default C, not break any of the KJ util. Cloud9 will default C, they break the KJ util and then reset. Even though they have like less util, they're getting way more value on attack. Yeah. I don't, I don't also, understand 100 Thieves read at the moment dude, when I watch It was them play. tragic though. 100 Thieves are burning their Trailblazer off the rip to get B control, so they have no ability to retake towards A. They also don't have any Viper utility down, so they can't like slow contact reclear A. So it's so obvious where they are on the map at all times. I mean, look at this. Look, the round that we're looking at, round five, they've they've tried to go for a retake towards A. I think this is the round where 100 Thieves even won, but mm. everybody on C9 is here. They all know that it's here. Oh no, Leaf wins this round or something, doesn't he? By yeah, because Asna is just like untradeable, has bomb, no yeah, one's with, with him. Yeah, with Spike as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just so garbage. And I mean, we, we had Sliggy on talking earlier about um, Footballist playing against 100 Thieves on this map when 100 Thieves were running the Cypher. And their whole game plan was just like, take somewhere else on the map and then have Stella lurk towards A with his Cypher cap. They, they just don't get how to play this. So I think it's a great pick from Cloud9 to put them here. But the fact that 100 Thieves also didn't win on Ascent and they looked... I mean, again, terrible. Like, Cryo looks completely he looks like he's still out of his gamer. depth. <laughs> like, he's that slow uh, on a lot of places. Like, I, I barely feel like he's taking the space that he needs to uh, almost ever on a scent when that's, like, literally the Jets only role uh, in a lot of cases. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this is what I've... This is... Under Thieves is just not improving and you're seeing now desperation in a lot of, in a lot of cases, too. For example, Austin, again way too well not necessarily way too aggressive but like too aggressive when his team wants to fall back like that sort of thing has been happening over the last three weeks at this point um so yeah this is uh this is pretty bad yeah. I, and, yeah. and i think what what their strength of schedule is insanely difficult if i They're remember done. correctly like it's it's yeah it's, it's i mean over. this is the question like, like what world can they yeah. actually make playoffs they like, should have hit that panic button like <laughs> <laughs> weeks ago oh. So uh, the next four teams after Crew is Leviathan, NRG, Loud, Furia. That is really. every good team. That is like the top four teams in America's yeah. back to back to back. And yeah, I think I was definitely being too kind when I said it wasn't tragic because it was bad. But yeah, I'd say it was but, a tragic. Like the, the attack sides too, just every time. It just looks like they have no idea what they're doing. And it feels like they're never having 
like any proactivity with cryo even when they're on the attacking side even when they're running like these double initiator comps also these rounds where like c9 was going for this like a uh, dare variation of like not quite the tiles crunch, but this b main pop they sick, done man. this in, in so many series before in their previous series they did this like twice they did it or they did it three times before they did it twice in the series under things was just not ready for it ever uh, uh in this one as well in the default too they would have like a player playing like deep in b main to just hold that space and then C9 would just walk someone up and they would just look like they're not paying attention. Get owned. Like the mid round yeah. just was, it looked lost. I don't know. It, it feels like they're always moving in a direction though. It's not like, uh, like K Corp or anything like that. Sure. Like, <laughs> but, uh, but that's well, like such downwards, a low so that's bar not a good direction. the expectation of this scene. Like they have moments where they look solid, but I still feel like overall, like the attacking sides, it's like, when the uh, kind of initial default fails or like Cloud9 does something aggressive, they're just really lethargic to react, I think. Yeah, they, they seem like they've lost a lot of their confidence and I'm not exactly sure what it's from. Um, I think the, the thing that I was focusing on pretty heavily was the fact that, you know, they'd been talking in interviews a lot about how they've deconstructed a lot of their set plays and their set protocol stuff hoping to make things a bit more flexible Whoa. and uh are they still saying that because i, I no, that they, only... no that's what i mean they said it at the beginning of the yeah, okay uh, of the split. because and obviously so, that's not the right approach right like <laughs> i agree but i also think that when you look at when you look at their again like that response to that set tiles crunch there doesn't seem to be a set response no to protocol, it yeah. and it's not like there are fast protocols to getting pushed on other sides of the maps and also they're like when they were hit with their a execs just looked like they hadn't talked it through like they used the cannon dart and they dash to try and put pressure on the a player and then cryo just kind of wanders in and it's like no if you've burnt all your that if you've burnt all your utility and you haven't got that space you need to at least get people posted and ready to use another wave of initiated utility to to be able to get in like you need you need a ko flash to be able to pop in there or you need at least multiple people swinging and it, it it just looks very lost and they look like they don't have anything set. Um, it's, it's bizarre. Uh, the other part too is they've got rid of James, their um, assistant coach. Who knows why? I was say, is there any, did anyone know why? Was that like a financial issue or was James like a too many like cooks in the kitchen? Because even when I watched their comments videos from Lockin, like seeing his input in between, ga uh, in between games or after they lose was like really cool to see. Just hearing him in the background, I know James is a really intelligent guy, really smart when it comes to Valorant. So when I saw that, I was like, this has to be like a fine, right? Like this can't be, he doesn't seem like a detriment to the team whatsoever. hundred teams have been letting go of a lot of people for financial reasons recently. Um, the coaching staff is so much smaller than when Sean was with the team. I mean, massively, massively smaller. Sean had James and Mike and uh, an analyst team, have, I believe, didn't as well. Have James. Yeah, he did. He was working with... No, wasn't he? No, James no, was C9 awesome. at the time. Yeah. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Yeah. So what is... When was James... Uh, in the offseason. It was... It was, it was before lock-in, I think. Yeah. Like the same time they picked up Cryo. Oh, right. Okay, okay. That wasn't, I thought there was another assistant coach. It wasn't just Mike. May, maybe there was. I don't remember, though. No. Right, okay. Maybe I've mixed that up then. But, it, but even they, still... They, they definitely they, had a lot more people they, involved. They don't even have a sixth player right now. Isn't that like against the partnership I think rules? that's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> is DDK their sub right now? Like, that would heck? be insane, actually. <laughs> DDK just subs in. He plays Jet like it's Quake or some shit. That'd be hilarious, bro. No, he just plays Neon. And just... Oh, that'd be great. I saw DDK in ranked yesterday. I invited him to the game, but I didn't Pause. realize he was prepping to play. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> didn't realize he was prepping. Yeah, I mean, the, James was their sixth, right? Yeah, it, I, they didn't have anybody else, so. Or, I mean, how does the rule set Let work? Let me go to would the, the uh, would it I'm become, going would it be, to the spreadsheet. I feel like it would have to be Mike's that would play then, right? No, he can't because he's listed as the head coach. Can you play without a coach? That's illegal too, right? You, you get fined for dropping down below the minimum as well. I would imagine that James has been let go whilst being retained as their sixth for an interim period uh, in order to avoid the fines and costing them more. If, then if what I do they do guess. if someone gets sick? It's like, oh, fuck, sorry. I know we fired you, James, but you got to come back for one <laughs> If someone last gets sick, game. they're playing while they're sick. That's what's happening yeah. with 100 Thieves right now. Ugh. I'm going to yeah. cope. 100 Thieves is like my second favorite team. So I'm coping. I think they'll bounce back. I think they would benefit a lot from what you were saying as maybe incorporating some setups and set plays now. Because I know with uh, working with Abby's early on, from the very beginning, we're like, okay, screw this set shit. We need to learn how to fucking talk to each other and play off of each other just organically off on the fly. Like learn how to play the game. But, but I feel like there's a time and place. And after that period is over, we also were like, okay, 
we've gone to this point now we can start incorporating like setups set plays and stuff like that that we can like lean on now that we but know how to play off of each other point? i think I they like were a lot already. of the issues you've seen with them have been fundamental at least in the last few weeks here's what happens though a lot of times is you go through that process that mel you're saying i've gone through that before where it's like uh, that i've tried to implement new strats with a new team and it's like dude like we don't know how the fuck to play with each other yet so you just start winging it and you start mostly poking it for the most most part and then you start introducing that but what happens is when you introduce the sets then all of a sudden it goes back to not being able to play with each other again <laughs> especially it's if it's just not so fully strange protocol. as well because it's it was only one change it was literally just one player out will gone cryo in like that's that, that was the only fucking change so it like feels weird that like so much of the issues we're seeing with this team seems like it's around like the calling and the ideas and like the, honestly the fundamentals like such a strange the, situation. The trading does not exist for this team in the same way no. that it used to. I mean, it's just so all fallen to pieces. Like yeah. Champions era, this team was like but, actually fantastic at that. I feel. To me, I think a lot of that comes down to a confidence loss. Like the way that Cryo is playing, it isn't confident at all. He's not being able to get into good spots. And then the players behind him are all timid as well. And it means that other people have to be running forwards. Like I think, I, I think the... I think the way in which Cryo is playing, or the way in which like he's, um, yeah, I think the way in which he's playing is causing a lot of other issues for other people playing off of him as well. And I think obviously the Cryo was getting a lot of value on other teams before, specifically Exit. So I can't help but kind of blame Hundred Thieves for their integration of him more so than cryo himself for not living up to what we expected him to be uh, i know that i mean wyatt like we said at the beginning of the episode has a concussion currently and he spent about uh, 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 he's not supposed to be thinking or watching vods or anything like that because he's literally got you know a brain injury at the moment but he spent a long time looking back over these vods and i was dropping some food off for him and he was kind of explaining that he just couldn't believe what he was watching. Like he's got, <laughs> he's got a concussion and memory problems, and he's still more annoyed at Hundred Thieves than he <laughs> than he was at his own situation. And uh, he said he looked at it a lot in like pretty slow motion, like really rigorously. And he was amazed at how poorly they were uh, playing for each other, specifically Derek as well. Just so many opportunities where Derek could be swinging for people and, and, and wasn't. And that's not something that I've noticed particularly, but I also didn't go over it with a fine tooth comb. But it definitely seems like there is just this lack of ability to play off each other. Um, let's, let's talk about the big game then this week. There was one game that everyone was talking about. Loud Furia, the power rankings, the predictions, etc., etc. Mimi's got some stuff to say. <laughs> yep. Loud is still good. Loud is still the best team in America's. Like, okay. I, I want to start off by saying, I agree with you guys. Fury looked fantastic. Loud such a misuse. They were testing some comps out. Some of that wasn't working. Some of the ideas were off. I understand why the Fury Copium was there. But also, at the end of the day, it is loud and they do not lose to other Brazilian teams. And they are just fantastic. Like, this entire game was so good from them like honestly i think the things that stuck with me the most was just like their incredible coordination in the late rounds on the split game particularly with their retakes like the way that like cowenzine and less were playing or excuse me cowenzine and ospas were playing together in the last few moments of this game was just fucking incredible they had so many like great rounds that they managed to pull off, off of that one and also just the calling was on point. It felt like a lot of the ideas they had was clear kind of counters to stuff that Furia has done in the past. I think this is a very predictable map pool. And on split, I think it really showed that the the read was a lot better from Loud. Yeah, I mean, they just went back to the double duelist thing too. And I think that's really good against um, this, against teams who aren't necessarily like the best teams on split uh especially like against a double controller or something like that like that that becomes a lot harder to convince me that that comp is good against that but um yeah i also think that that helped all of their players get insanely online like best of lock-in type performances from all the like yes. Cowanzine, from aspas from literally every single player that was on that team like, and the movement that counts dude that guy's fucking insane 
his movement yeah. and gunfight shit. is ridiculous. Um, and yeah, I mean, even on split, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily like just a blowout or anything like that. I still I still think, um, particularly Mazin from Furia, popped the fuck off. Oh, but... he was so good on like ooh, like the second half. Mazin was insane. Yeah. But also like this this Furia chamber stuff, like the the way they prepped against it, going back to the double duels was comp was so good. Like yeah. every round, Digizin set up. It was like, okay, you're getting overrun by it, Osmos yeah. and Sigal. <laughs> Dude, no I value. honestly thought they were cooking. I, for a second, I, I, thought they I were watched this game too. last night. For a second, I was like, <laughs> man, maybe they're cooking with the chamber. Because it's like, you know, they're thinking like, okay, let's just get like a better jet on our defense. One that can give us a trip in fucking ropes or something. Or one that can give us a trip here while they op. But then you look at how loud played jet anchor A. Because Aspas likes to jet anchor A. And it's like somehow jet is a better anchor at it's A crazy. opping than chamber. <laughs> it is, gen I, dude, like, I think it was like fucking like round like 17. You literally just see Aspas take a shot, updraft, dash back sight, yeah. drop smoke. And, and it's like, meanwhile, yep. yeah. And then meanwhile, you see DJ Zine do the exact same thing. And loud just punishes him because he TPs two fucking feet away. <laughs> <laughs> they were not cooking. They were not cooking anymore. I don't there know. Were, yeah, no. I, but I, Aspas I, is insane. I mean, there's not many people who op like that. Do that. <laughs> yeah, that's sure. also true. Yeah. I mean, I think both Aspas and Kaozin just had like the fucking best movement in this. You guys already talked about Kaozin, but look, Aspas look dude, is so good. Yeah, just was insane. Uh, any any of the like one v two, one v three moments that happened in this game, and there was a lot of them, by the way. It was not like super clean like the little jiggle steps yeah. in between his first tap is just crazy good and for that to work at this level by the way is ridiculous because these guys are hitting the first shot every single time like if you if you try to go for an extra movement you're getting hit most of the time before you even get that movement out so yeah i mean it's impressive to say the least oh this yeah i think it's this round this, isn't it Where this, like he can't, Chamber can't do this. Why does Jet look like a better anchor than Chamber? This is it. The Jet escapability, especially when oh, you have someone like Aspas, is insane. It just went it wasn't away, but it, it was It was one of the rounds. I think it was heaven in yeah. the round that we're thinking of. I don't know, but either way, I completely agree with you. But there aren't many players that move like Aspas moves when he's Jet opping. Like, there's a lot of people that Jet op really well, but they don't instantly get out of situations, use their updraft to keep momentum, to get around corners. Like... Aspas's jet movement is extraordinarily good. Um, and it makes a huge difference for his ability to find value in moments like this. Oh, yeah, I guess it was I think this it round. is this round. Yeah, they just hit it late. Like, dude, look at this guy. This guy is so... Like, every time I think I've seen it all with Jet, even for us on my team, I just watch this guy and it's like, bro, like, what the fuck? Is... Who thinks of this shit? He's out of there. Like, and he buys so much time, gets a kill, and then the whole rotates are all here. Like, how is he better than James? Danny gets yeah. the out, man. <laughs> I mean, and while that's all happening, Loud is like fully ready to like crunch yeah. onto heaven. So while he's doing all this bullshit and like distracting everyone, it just all for the rest of Loud is crunching heaven to retake that space and owning. Yeah, it might not seem like that sexy for highlight because he only goes one for one and he even missed the first shot, but he's just absorbing all of their attention and everybody else on Loud gets full heaven control and then just cr destroys them. It's so good. Mm -hmm. Um, The... Uh, the, the overall game as well, I feel like there was a major difference in terms of how the pistol rounds were going. Furia were winning 80% of the pistol rounds this year. They only won one out of four in the game. And Loud went back to their... Like, when Loud were doing the, their best at Champions, they were winning a shit ton of pistols. Insanely good pistol team. And that was one of the first things that the players gave Fraud credit for. Uh, Fraud, who was now their head coach. Um, but they, they just went straight back to being extraordinarily good. And they utterly dismantled them on Icebox. I think default pistols are the wave. Other than Icebox, like everyone's going to run like a set pistol. Let's be real. Just hit ALO. But like <laughs> I've noticed like default pistols have been getting a lot of value. Even for V1, like we've been doing more default pistols. And more often than not, we've been winning most of them in scrims and in matches. It's kind of insane how much value you can get. I think, loud, yo, loud on this map, on defense, they bought five frenzies on Icebox. Yeah. On a map where you just think that's like the least likely map to run a frenzy. They, and they won a flawless CT pistol with just frenzies. It was insane. And Aspas pushes up B and like yes. just hides there on a close angle with the frenzy. It honestly made no sense to me when I watched it. I was like, actually, wait, they're cooking, bro. Like, you think get sheriffs? Because we had a similar pistol in V1 where we had 4B, but we had sheriffs. But I'm like, dude, maybe we need to get frenzies. Like, the, the fights on this <laughs> map, you can make them closer than you think, to be honest. Yes. Yeah. I, I also think that there was like, what, Fury of putting down the their their harbor wall where he was just sitting behind it as well um that 
Yeah, also they have like so many follow up. Like this one was so cool because Dude, they, they so get this good. fight and then they, yeah. they just cascade into the spawn. This, this is the <laughs> best harbor team easily. Obviously, they're the first harbor team as well. The first real harbor team. Well, DRX were playing playing on this map too. So that, no, 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 that no, really does they, mean something. Loud, loud are are the ones who have committed to it on all yeah. like the most possible maps and it shows like they know how to play so many different variations on all these different maps where you don't expect that there's variations that you could actually run on icebox right you, you expect okay let's just go post plant but like even on pearl for example drx is just trolling by going for post plant every single round on belong which you know is maybe the meta but loud also has like a million different ways to take B link and a million different ways to follow up off of that and, and hit whichever site you want, which is way, way better than any other team. Like yeah. you, you expect some of this like aggro wall stuff at the beginning on defense that loud does to set up Aspas all the time when they have a flashless comp and nobody else does that. Nobody else does that yeah. sort of thing. I mean, the way that Aspas was playing in general, playing off the cove was crazy. They weren't using the cove to get plants on their attack side that much. They were using the cove to, like, bait spam, and then Aspas would be on top of screens killing everybody. It's like, no one's doing that. Nobody yeah. is doing that with the harbor right now. It, it, it actually, though, it means to me watching the game that they really did respect Furia. Because it's like what we were oh, yeah. talking about earlier with EMEA. Fnatic and Navi are just hiding shit. They're not showing their... their, their true strength in these games um this felt like true strength loud like top strength loud they brought something curated different they showcased how fresh their old comp could feel it was very good but also yeah, yeah it kind of made all the difference because Fury got fucking flattened is it weird to say too that i was watching this game and i don't even think furia is like even a bad team like i'm still hoping i'm on the furia train i think that loud was just so much better that i feel like they are like a tier of their own also like bro how does he get that kill bro like <laughs> fucking he's 50 meters away <laughs> and that pisses me off I, yeah no yeah. i agree with you mel i feel like it I'm was actually you. like not egregious from from furia uh, i i think the the main issues that i saw in this one is like they cooked a little too much with the split comp. I want to see them yeah. change that comp. I don't think that yeah. one really works out. But I think the icebox was mostly fine. Like, I'm fine with them still playing the old comp instead of that Harbor Viper. But a lot of it just came down to, I think, just really good stuff from Loud that we've already talked about. And for me, uh, I still feel like Fury is a, a top team. Like, uh, I don't know if it's totally shifts for me. I, I agree. I think... Um... The only thing that really scares me is the fact that uh, Khalil didn't have as monstrous of a of a yeah. game, and MW still just not finding his form here in America. It's like mm -hmm. like he did in that Fnatic game. Like that's the type of M MW that if you want this team to be a top team, needs to be coming out every once in a while. Um, but as far as the Icebox comp, I actually really don't like them going for Sage on this map. If they are trying to go for Harbor or Viper on other maps, I feel like that should become a core thing that they're looking to implement rather than. Um, especially because they're doing it on Haven too, by the way. It's not like yeah. they're they're doing it on even more maps than you would expect from like like for example NRG who's just running it on um on just Pearl, oh. I guess. So yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like you should be working towards that when I, you I like have the Icebox comp. I think it's they're not very... bringing anything new with the Sage though either. Like that's the, my problem. No, I there's, think the, the fact that they're not bringing harder. much that's new is definitely an issue. But to me, the, the two big problems that I noticed for Fury during this game that concerned me a little bit were that they had no answer to Aspas operating. On, on split, the Aspas defensive jet orb was getting gigatons of value, and they just could not get around it in the slightest. Uh, and the other part to that is that, that after they got punched by Loud, their players just couldn't pick it back yeah. up. I think they collapsed. I think there was a mental part to the game of them getting kind of halfway through the map and realizing. Well, I don't better. think that I don't. I don't think a mental aspect is uh, just because they they show a little bit of uh, I don't know whatever you're saying here about their mental against Leviathan. That was a big strength for them. So like I think that I think it's specific against Loud. I think it's because they've they just know that Loud are the best Brazilian team. It's just oh, in the okay. back of their heads. They it's just know problem, that they're then. better. They don't need to beat Loud. Yeah, but I think yeah, that, that but that goes back to my point where it's like I don't think this shifts my ranking for Fury down. I thought they were like a top a top four American team. I think there's a lot of fluctuation within. I think the only thing I'm like solid on is like loud is gonna be number one. Everyone else will flex around in that position. I still feel that way. I still feel like this team um will probably or could win their game against NRG. I think everything else in their schedule is like looking at it now, EG, Cloud9, MIBR. 
100 Thieves, and then Sentinels. I think they win so every many, one of those games teams. except maybe it's NRG. Free. Yeah, yeah, like I think they just roll their way through to be the second best team in the league. All right, well, the big upset result from this week, the one that we kind of talked about a little bit earlier but deserves its own segment, was NRG losing to MIBR. Um, we cursed them, but also I really did think that that was a bit of a guarantee. MIBR were just coming off a game of... I guess they pushed loud a little bit. They won a map of them. But then they also had a really close win over Crew that did not look convincing. And then they come in here, and NRG lose the series 1-2. OTs all over the place, very close maps. There was no map where NRG looked dominant. It wasn't like, um, yeah, often often these losses, there's like one map where the team that's expected to win smokes the other team and there's two close losses. Wasn't like that really here. I mean, MIBI were just up close with them the entire time. So what do you think went wrong for NRG to lose this one? Um, I think it's the problem that they're, they've been displaying kind of the entire time hasn't been coming to the forefront because they haven't had like a major loss like this yet, but their, their roles are all over the place and it's causing mad inconsistency in, in all, all of their players. Um, uh, Victor and crashes are the most consistent players and that that's good. I mean, they're playing very well, but they've always been more flexible than everybody else. Anyways. Um, Som is the only guy who has a consistent role on this team right now. And I think that's a major problem. Um, so, Plus, also, like, when they're going for the Harbor Harbor Sky stuff, which is very good, they rely way too much on the Sky right now um, to actually get value with the Flash, like, actually trying to guarantee a Flash, and they swing with it, and that's causing them a lot of deaths against um, teams who are able to just dodge the Flash, which is very easy. Yeah, I, I also feel like for this team, like, I agree on the roll stuff, like, specifically, like, their Pearl map, I feel like their defensive side, like, just... I, it didn't really feel like to me they were playing to their strengths. My thought with this with this race comp was that it was going to be a pretty good like exploitative way to play against Harbor Viper because like Harbor Viper versus Harbor Viper like perfect mirror matches I think are really tough to play right now, especially on Pearl because uh, it almost always just be like retake simulator on the B site for like both both sides when they're on defense. But for them, I thought their game plan with this comp was to play a little bit more proactive B, use like raise nades into coves to try and like shut down plants, use like the sky flashes to fight through and hopefully find a little bit more value i didn't really see that and when it did just come down to like the straight up retakes it didn't feel like the coordination was fully there and then also like you're bringing up like when the other two maps the series on both icebox and split there was always like a player who just felt like looked uncomfortable like the 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 victor rays was solid on split but i victor didn't rays feel like the like artists like Killjoy was that I, I don't it's just like it's so weird this team feels like they have like solid ideas and they have those moments where they're really good but they're just not able to find consistency and I think it probably is like the amount of like juggling of ideas and roles that they're having that is a contributing factor by the way they were plus 10 on first kills on that final map the one where they lost 14 16 it was 10 first bloods to 20 first was bloods frying. for NRG Victor was frying on that like yeah and they it was still like genuine first well bloods? Too. Like, was it treated immediately, or did they really just like up five v four? And I think there it was were, Victor. There were a lot like, of straight five v four. That is insane. Like their defensive side with Victor's up was so good. MIBR like didn't find an answer to it, but then just the second half fell apart. Yeah, there was also like a lot of. Um, it didn't feel like Finesse was able to read this team as well because it definitely felt like MIBR was just kind of floating randomly between both sides without at some point giving up starting to like give any sort of faint or anything like that and they would just rotate towards one side and i think finesse was like trying to rotate the killjoy around to try to read it but it just was not working especially on icebox like that kj was moving everywhere and constantly mrb was just like the other side <laughs> I also... and that was the same game plan the entire time from mibr too so it was surprising yeah the um the the mid plays were getting very heavily shut down on Icebox too. That was um, something that ended up going a bit rough. Uh, the I, I feel like the when you look at the way that the kind of the the exchange of gun rounds and stuff, it's not like NRG sucked in the second half um, of split. Sorry, but losing the bonus after losing the pistol just puts you dead even. And then from there, it's just, you know, it's, it's just an 8-8 game where 
NRG are on the attack side of split, you're not really favoured in that situation to, to win anymore, despite the fact that you were 8-4 up at the half. Yeah. I, I, I didn't feel like NRG actually played terribly here. I don't... No. I don't think even that when I was watching, I thought, oh, you know, their players on weird roles look uncomfortable. It just felt like the normal NRG masterful rounds that they pull out or extremely good team play off each other or big moments didn't seem to be happening particularly. I felt like it was a very mediocre overall game from them. Whereas previously, even when NRG have been losing, even when they lost to uh, Leviathan, I thought that apart from their Lotus, the first map, what was it, Pearl, I think? Yeah. Was lovely. Well, they had like a gorgeous game plan. It, it, you could exactly see what they were going for, manipulating their opponents. It just ended up being that Leviathan were better on the retakes than NRG ended up being in the post plans. But in this game, I couldn't really see the vision. It, it felt like an off game from FNS, more from like a, a read of the game perspective rather than a fragging perspective. Although I suppose it ended up being from a fragging perspective too. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was getting at, especially on Icebox, particularly. Or I mean, it, it was a theme in both games, or all three maps was MIBR just playing slow, working picks, and then slowly rotating to another site and grouping up and hitting. And oftentimes the read was wrong I mean, from energy. <laughs> Wow. Well, that was physical. that was sick because he, he uh, got pinged by the flash, so they knew he was there, and he just spammed based off of the mark. It was really cool. I mean, the uh, turret sees him as well, doesn't it? No, because it smoked off, I think. Oh, was it? He yeah, was yeah, stuck looked... in like the super tight corner, so you couldn't see him, actually. Yeah, a, a, crazy, <laughs> a crazy game. Now, also, I think this might be avoiding some responsibility for us because we did utterly curse NRG. And that's the second time in two matches that we've cursed NRG. Because we full predicted them for the game against Leviathan, and now we full predicted them in the game against well, MIBL. I mean, this isn't our fault against... I mean, it's not like... Uh, it's, it's just... It's just... Man, it's, more, it's more disrespect to MIBR uh, out of anything, right? It's not... We're not... NRG, if, don't come if after Bren us. If Bren had been here, if Bren had been here, he thought MIBR was going to... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Ridiculous <laughs> MIBR wasn't MIB, Wasn't Bren on the uh, episode? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> he was. He was. Episode, and he predicted bro. NRG. And he literally, I'm pretty sure he said, he repented about MIBR. He said, sorry guys, I was trolling about MIBR. All good. But NRG's he wasn't gonna trolling. Look at this guy. He, he repented <laughs> too early. <laughs> he wasn't trolling, though. No, That's he the wasn't. Thing. When we were talking to the power I think he was trolling. It wasn't about, no. Bren was trying to get us to move at, uh, MIBR from like, what, 7th or something like that? Uh, and replace them with Fury, okay? And yeah. the, the, maybe you thought he was trolling, but I was not trying to make the argument that MIBR was bad. Like, I, I, I mean, maybe it came out that way. Maybe I, all right. I mean, I'm I think stop. the issue was he was talking. trying to replace Furia with yeah. MIBR. Yeah, he was and trying to drag Furia, Furia down the rankings. Yes, yes. Um, anyways, Brandon. But also MIBR is good. Like, they're a team who I think has, like, a pretty could, solid shot of, like, mm -hmm. probably making playoffs and, like, being a, 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 continuing to be, like, a team who can upset, like, top teams in America's. Look at these fucking yeah. Bren and Josh both playing both sides on both weeks. Uh, whenever oh. power ranking. No, no, huh? no, 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 yeah, no, 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 no. Pro, pro. <laughs> Fury is the best team, by the way. I agree with Bala. Oh, I'm going to predict loud, by the way. Uh... Just because wow. just because a team is currently the best doesn't mean that they're going to be the best the next week. Huh? <laughs> power rankings are supposed to rank the power going into next week. No, you're supposed to rank the power of what you've just seen. But it, it, it's like inherently predictive. No, it's not. No, no, no. She's. I mean, uh, Josh is right. Josh is right. I agree with this. Roll. But you're still playing both sides. <laughs> yeah, but in the best possible way. <laughs> I did yeah. think Furia looked better than Loud from that previous week. Now I don't anymore. Easy. Nice. Double nice. you analysis. Uh, <laughs> yeah, easy, easy. Dude, you know what energy reminds me of right now? What? And I know, I know, Josh, you're actually right. Like, I don't feel like any player is particularly uncomfortable on their role. It's not like Saucy on smokes or CNET on smokes or Pankati on, uh, uh, on KJ or anything like that. They don't look uncomfortable, but they don't look super comfortable. They don't look insane. Nobody is coming out with, like, crazy yeah. good playmaking on, on their individual uh, agents. And that reminds me a lot of old-ass FPX, where they're yeah. just, like, coming out with random for why type of decisions that but, but why not just like well who's who's the duelist who's the smoker who's the flex who's the sentinel like let's <laughs> get down to it man that makes my job easier 
And then maybe we won't curse <laughs> you. That is such a throwback. Remember when Sha was Jet on FPX and fucking Angel yeah. went on an interview and was like, we actually have the best Jet in the world in our team. We had no idea. And he was like, Sha on Jet. <laughs> Dude, that Dude. was such a throwback. But that, that low key is reminding me of that. And I don't know. As artists brought the poison oh. from old FPX over. <laughs> oh. No, but he wasn't even he on old FPX. The... Oh my God, you're right. Because no, you're talking like ancient deck. Because once yes. he was on FPX, they figured their shit out. The Shao the Shadows. Kind of. They Zip didn't on. figure their I mean, shit out completely. But the thing is, like, they still made it to international. They had events Angel playing Jet did. with artists on the team. Yeah, but I, think they I mean, were, but that like, was when he was subbing trolling. in the fucking Grand Finals. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were I playing in the Grand Finals. That wasn't a troll game. Well, I mean, it kind but of was. It was a, they it was a troll anyway. game. It was inherently a troll game. Like, they, they trolled an EMEA last year, but it's... I don't know, I don't know. There's a conspiracy theory here. I'm not seeing the bigger picture yet, but there's a fucking picture out there. Holy shit. Okay. <laughs> The, uh, the final thing in the, in the runner show here from Kurt says, special message from a secret special guest. I don't know what that is. Do, uh, do we have that? Oh, God. It's so brain. I wanted to ask Brent to make a fun recording talking about MIBR, but he just ghosted me. Oh. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't even know it was Brent. I was just like, I know it's going to be fucking Brent. <laughs> roll the clip. Amazing. All right. No, there is no clip. Brent ghosted. Nope. Them. You roll um, it. Where all right, is it, Brent? So, Go to America's stream. America's right Super now. Week predictions. Let's let's get into the press because I keep Guys, wanting to ask Guys, if we you... all predict NRG, I'm gonna freak out. It better <laughs> oh, not happen. Yikes! I'm sorry. I keep Wait. wanting to ask you guys, like, oh, how do you think they're gonna do in the Super Week? But that's what this whole segment is. So now we get to talk about it properly. I don't even so remember the... who NRG's playing. Uh, NRG are playing against Cloud Nine, and then oh. I can't remember who the other team is. Anyway, let's get into the first game. We'll go through them in a bit of a weird order, but we're gonna start with. Loud Sentinels, the first game of the week. It's a banger. The Brazilian players playing against their old squad. And Sentinels. Nobody's gone with Sentinels. Yeah, certified guarantee. Plot this track. is a real honest guarantee. There is absolutely no way Sentinels win. They're subbing someone at the last minute. They have turmoil behind the scenes. They're trying to figure something out. And Loud just looks insane. There's no way. Uh, it's so cool that Marv is playing in this game. He fucking can't escape. He can't escape <laughs> going against Loud. Imagine if that's the kryptonite, though. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if Sentinels actually win when Marv is on the team. That would be fucking hilarious. But, like, history is crazy, because it's also, like, the two old Loud players now playing against their former teammate, plus Marv playing against yes. his rivals. Sheesh. Like, it's crazy. They formed, it's like old, loud, and NRG have just come together in order to take down the organization. <laughs> <laughs> like they, couldn't, they, could, they couldn't beat loud separately, so now they've joined together to take them down. Yeah. Uh, having said that, it's a bit like the Liquid Fanatic game, I feel, in EMEA, where the storyline's fantastic, but they ain't going to win. So, yep. But the storyline's really good, so watch it, probably. It's exciting and cool. <laughs> I, th I think it will be a fun game to watch and I actually do personally I think the Sentinels are gonna, uh, probably end up playing better than they did last week even last week damn. yeah I think so I, I think that the um, I mean they have been playing up like almost every single one of their games has been like somewhat interesting even the game against NRG for example was like somewhat interesting until the the last map uh, yeah I think they'll probably get just destroyed on one of the maps but the um yeah Maybe they don't look as good on like specific pistol prep or whatever, but mm -hmm. I think their overall gameplay will probably be still very decent. Let's have a look at the next game. This one's pretty, uh, pretty fun one. It's Leviathan playing against MIBR. And maybe at the beginning, we wouldn't have had any expectations here. Is anyone taking a punt? God, we are no. so dumb. We're so dumb. We're so <laughs> stupid. I hate this. <laughs> this this, this is, not, is ridiculous. This is not a guarantee. <laughs> uh, I swear, we need to go back to the old <laughs> system where even if we all predicted something, we had to say whether or not it was a guarantee. Because no, at the moment, no, we're just, no, no, we're just no, handing no, out no, these no, guarantees no, 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 no. We're like pretty good. Candy. We're pretty good. We're actually pretty good right now. We're still yeah. above the 40% that we were last year when you guys all started trolling. So we're pretty good. My counterpoint, <laughs> my counterpoint to this is that I think it incentivizes you guys to take a risk in order to prevent the yeah, guarantee. Yeah, but I didn't know, didn't I didn't know whether any of the others were. You could do it right now, Josh. Do it it's, right now. It's like a fucking prisoner's dilemma. No, the screenshot's been taken. It's too late. No, it's not. I, <laughs> it's too late. Well, okay. Uh, I just... Uh, oh, Josh, I feel like... can you honestly argue that you think MI is going to win this matchup? No, but I think they've got a good shot at winning the matchup. I don't think it's a guarantee in the same way that Loud over Sentinels is a guarantee. I think that they've got... I think MIBR are going to be an upset team in America's. Yes. 
But I think they've already cashed in their upset bucks last week on, M uh, on NRG. <laughs> so. They're out of funds. So here's, a, here's, a, here's a question. Is Leviathan a team that as more footage gets out there of them, they become a lot worse? Because it's been the case where they look fucking insane at the beginning of tournaments always, and then, and then they lose, and they lose badly. They were doing I mean, the same pistol battle. Yeah, yeah. I, was I just could actually say. see it. I was like, gonna, Sentinels had some good prep. No, it's like, dude, they were, I was surprised to see people running like similar pistols. Like on uh, Sensei's anti strat was literally just dodge the omen blind and then hold the window. But I yeah. think for like Le Le Leviathan, if they play split, they rely a lot on these mid round one v one pushes on defense. Like they'll just like. At like 50 seconds or one minute, and they don't have any info cross map, they don't have mid control, they just push B main. Like, and then the, the round solely rides on that B main push. But if they win that fight or if he sees nothing, they have a complete good stack of A. Or it's like they need to push down mid. Like this guy just takes an insane 1v1 against Sassy. Sassy knows it's coming, he still loses the fight. Like, I feel like teams read into that like really important, like 1v1, like lane uh, space taking like later into the round. I feel like they could actually get hard anti. I'm not gonna lie. They do it pretty consistently on a lot of maps. I feel yeah. like the problem, though, with this discussion is that MIBR have won like two out of how many maps have they won? Five or something? But two of those have been on Lotus. They beat Loud on Lotus. They beat MIB. Uh, they beat uh, Crew on Lotus. I think it was. Um, and I just think Leviathan look way too good there. Their game against NRG, they just looked like they knew exactly where they wanted to go on the on the map, and their B retakes looked fantastic. I don't see how MIBR get. An advantage there. And maybe are also not very good on Ascent. You have to be good on Ascent to be able to beat Leviathan. I'm not saying they're best in the world anymore. They've lost the last two, but you have to be good. Sentinels beat them, so I mean... <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, like, I mean, yeah. what do you have? You have, like, your... Uh, your they'll play Icebox. That'll be, probably get floated. Like, if you're... Uh, or MIBR looks like a pretty good Icebox team, and Leviathan yeah, looks are, tragic there. Like, I think MIBR gets a map if they, like, get an Icebox in the pool. But then where are you going to go? Ascent, maybe Pearl, are both maps we can get in the pool? I, I think Leviathan clears on both of those easily. Like... <laughs> I, I just don't I don't see the upset. I think it'll be closer than maybe you'd expect on paper, but I don't see the upset. Should they just get rid of Fracture instead and mm. bait MIBR into picking Fracture? Because if they leave Icebox open, Icebox is just an instant loss for Leviathan, no? Leviathan looked like they didn't know what they were doing there. They got smoked by Furia. Furia are a great team, but Have we seen I, I'd be willing with, to, for them to take a risk in the map pool. They're not their normal permabands fracture. Mm. I mean, that'd be MRBR crazy if they've been played it since it losing to Talon. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, but the, Talon they, was playing good to though. Talon. Dude, Talon, that was Talon when Talon was, was good. Good. That was when Talon, Talon, was, Talon was, was actually so good. And then seeing what happened now, I remember basing whether EG was good off of that game too. I was like, wow, Talon was good. Like, damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought EG was good after I got. I, I, I got had cool. such cope. Not even cope. I still, you know, I'm not gonna. If I say more, I will be in big trouble. I will not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. All right, next game. Crew plays against 100 Thieves. And for the love of God, if 100 Thieves can't win this one, <laughs> it is over. Over, done. Shut them down. No, 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 I'm switching my bread. I'm switching my bread. I'm switching my bread. Get me off of this. Get me out of here. Get me out. No, no too late. Shot. Too late. What do you mean? The <laughs> yeah, screenshot oh. was taken. Send me yeah, a message but that's beforehand. Fine, at least, please. Oh. It's too late. But, but then I can't. All right. This, this system is failing, then. The system is failing. <laughs> the system, system is failing. failing. All right. The tell, me why, failing. tell me why you're so averse to us all picking 100 Thieves here. Um, because, bro, what we just. We've, we've yeah, got this dreadful. entire episode, and we talked so much shit about them, and I haven't prided 100 Thieves like a single time. This, <laughs> let's go! Oh, this is crazy. And, and, this is and crazy. so I can't do it again, because every time I bet against 100 Thieves, it's been correct. And crew, Kesson's going to farm, dude. The Bro, Kesson, you are the coping. The you are always the cope. Kesson is going to run no in way. alone, try and make a solo play, and get yeah. owned, and yeah. then fucking no. Asuna and no. Cryo are going to kill no. everyone. He's going to run in alone. Cold. He's going to farm, and... 100 Thieves is going to be like, I don't know how to do this. I, Leaf was doing this to us the other day, and uh, we got shit on. What are we supposed to do, Mike? And, and he's Mike not is going to be like... not as good as Leaf, and it's not as good a team as Hub9. It doesn't matter. We were just talking oh. about EG versus Crew, and now you're saying 100 Thieves is going to lose to Crew? 
Crew that lost to is... EG. I mean, I'll be honest. The good, I predicted 100 Thieves. The main reason I'm doing this is because all y'all went for 100 Thieves. <laughs> Let's be real clear here. I mean, I am a bit confused what to pred here because I don't think either of these teams are very good. I'm just kind of thinking 100 Thieves did dismantle EG and then EG beat Crew. But also Crew played MIBR close. I don't know what to think about these squads anymore. I thank you for reducing the plat chat curse. Yeah. I think You're that's welcome. the only thing to say. I can't wait Thank to be Thank you, right. Uh Let's move on to probably the best game of Super Week. It's Evil Geniuses against <laughs> Furia. <laughs> this is a guarantee. Fucking smile. Um... <laughs> <laughs> is this every single time? I actually forgot about Furia. <laughs> You forgot you picked Fury, yeah? <laughs> you were gonna pick EG. Oh, I wanna no. hear the you no, Are you in trouble? Are you in trouble? Are you in trouble? I did have a few meme picks. I just forget which ones were the meme picks. <laughs> oh, and I the will not say picks. which ones were meme. I'm sorry. This okay. was it, to be honest. Do you think there's you a chance EG Fury wins? Is a meme pick and <laughs> no. EG's gonna win. It's just like one of those things where I look like a fucking prophet if I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see. I have some. I have. I might have some questionable picks upcoming. You'll. You'll have to see. I think this next one actually could be a moment for a questionable pick. So let's go into the next game. It's NRG against Cloud Nine. The battle for North America's last hope. Has anyone got? Oh, <laughs> Mimi's gone there. I'm not gonna do another. I refuse to do another curse to to NRG. First off, we've we've been down that road. Fuck that. Not gonna do that anymore. Second of all, Cloud9 was looking pretty good. Yeah, 100 Thieves yeah. is tragic, but C9's coordination was on point. I thought their like anti stratting and their game plan was really good. Uh, Leaf is the best player to ever touch the video game Valorant. He is insane. <laughs> Him and Zeppa as a duo continue to be fantastic. This team is really proactive in their mid rounds, has really good ideas. I think their map pool is improving, and I feel like they're looking very strong and NRG. We've talked about some of the problems before. It's still NRG. I think it was just an off week last week. I think they should still be favored to win this one uh, because of the experience, because of the, the player quality. But in the same vein, they've lost some games and some series that they shouldn't have with that MIBR series. Their roles are still kind of all over the place. And it's just, I don't have the normal confidence that I would have about that team. And on the other hand, Cloud9 has just impressed me so much in the last two weeks that I think I got to go for the punt on this one. Respectable. Most Wrong. importantly, they don't have real issues. <laughs> like, why is that such like a that's hell for like? I feel like you could just go. Does the team have real issues and just tell where they are? Fucking well, genuinely. Yeah. That's why they would never have worked with Yay. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I them. actually did not. Think, that is not me <laughs> subtweeting that at all. By the way, that genuinely was just like I was looking and I was like, oh, nice, it's working out. Uh... <laughs> Dang, you're getting in trouble today, Mel. I'm lucky. Dude, seriously, I need to get off of this. Jack's Jack coming, is not Jack's coming for you with the gun that he shot MC with. He didn't shoot pa MT. Potter's no. coming after you. No, no, stop, stop, stop. Um, this wasn't me. Dude, the same director of the Kaplan Sentinels video is the same one as the fucking C9 MC video. It's yeah, the it same feels director. like it. Jack Etienne had an Dude, inside by the job. End. By the Sentinels. end of America's, we're going to have just a compilation <laughs> of this video editor, this, this director. Yeah. <laughs> Coach is saying, yeah, everything is going to be good now. We had a little bit of issues, but uh, we're going to start farming in the next season. <laughs> And, the new uh, head coach BCJ comes on with a, <laughs> with a video about how he deliberately got benched so that he could help push the team towards relevancy. All right. <laughs> All right, let's do the next game. The next game's pretty interesting, actually. I could see this one going both ways. MIBR plays against Sentinels. Is anyone on the Sentinels cope? No! What? <laughs> That's just wrong. No, 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 That's just no, wrong. No, no, no. It's over. It's actually we all over. took the it's Sentinels fun. pill? Oh, my God. I mean, I thought I would be doing a bit of trollery here. How have we all gone for this? <laughs> Is it even cope? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's cope. It's yes. cope. Yes. It is cope. Oh my 
god. They haven't. They, they're fucking. Their coaching staff is exploding. They're bringing in a new player, subbing in who only just got his visa, so probably hasn't been practicing with the team. And I'm already just upset. NRG. Like this is extreme cope. Uh, I was on the the Mel train earlier, where she was talking about how uh, when you just start pugging it, it actually becomes better. And I think literally every single one of these guys are ranked gods, top True. top five oh, on the leaderboard 100%. right now. So it's I over. Also think like, Dude, a lot but... of MIBR was like their crazy late round pop offs, like Mazine like flashing into a site and like killing three on a retake. Like I think a lot of MIBR is like we're gonna play the slow default, we're gonna try and play our pick, and then we're just gonna have like a big late round where one of our players like pops up. Whereas like honestly, what if Sentinels is just better individually across the board? What if Sentinels <laughs> is just? Be I mean, holy shit! I mean, I mean, what what I don't understand name, about what name the head to head, name the head to head, huh? Better head to better better. Go ahead. From who? From from Just MIBR. Name the head to head. Yeah, Sassy versus. I mean, RGL is going to be playing against a content creator. <laughs> Oh, dude, Marv is Mar a world Mar champion. Marv Mar just taking that shit personally, bro. That's crazy. Fucking start the NBA screenshot quotes. <laughs> Marv is taking that shit personally. He's going to win Tokyo now, and he's going to point at you while you're casting the finals, and he's going to say, You motherfucker, I know what you said. I'm not a content creator. And then he's going to teabag you on stage. <laughs> What I'm confused about with this segment, though, is when we were talking about Sentinels, I said, I think they'll end up playing better than they did last week. And you, you guys were like, no, they're going to get worse. This team has so many issues. How the hell are they going to beat MIBR if they're going downhill in your heads? Like, to me, my pick makes sense because I'm imagining Sentinels actually being a bit improved just by virtue of having Sassy on initiated, that to me is going to make an enormous difference to the way in which they play. And having Zekin on Duelist, I think is going to be better for them than Tense. But in your world where they've got all of these problems and it's all uh, being a big issue, how the fuck do they get a win? Josh, the thing you're missing Arf. here is um, whenever you talk, I say the opposite. So... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have just, this is, this is disrespectful to MIBR. Yes. It yes, is, it but is. it's too late. If Brent it's was happened. here, he would not be standing for this. But he's but not what, here, what, what can he? he do? I mean, he uh, probably, Brent, you know, watch, I bet you, Kurt, uh, bring up Brent's prediction. Because I guarantee you it's Here's Sentinels. If he was I here, guarantee if you he was Brent here, went for he some would have trolling. It, and he would have fucking went, they have more. They have more. <laughs> Your mic just completely <laughs> fucked with auto gain. <laughs> Brent did not okay. uh, submit picks this week. Oh, he's got well, he submitted yeah, for America's. He's, he's not, can you, can you oh, you have to dig that up. We're, we'll find it at some point in the future. For now, let's move on to the next game. The next game is Leviathan playing against 100 Thieves. The beginning of their top four battle. <laughs> oh. Mm. And so I can explain. <laughs> okay. Please do. Um, this is honestly a hard cope because 100 Thieves is my second favorite team behind Energy and After Loud. So I guess favorite no, team. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, I watch all their comms videos and I wouldn't think that they are the, they are this placement right now. I am such a big fan. Like I watch their comms. I'm like, dude, their comms are so on point. Like I hear the adjustments that they're making. I hear the calls they're making. You know those comms. videos like, are edited, that. right, Mel? Oh, I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> but I can see the skill ceiling and it's their skill floor. And I just keep coping and saying they're having like a, they're just in a slump. They're just having a bad week. They're having a bad week. <laughs> no, I, at your some problem point, is the skill floor, not, not 100 Thieves. <laughs> That's what you said. I, I, I'm, I don't care if it's cope. I just don't. I actually think they could turn it around. I think, I mean, like, if we're this, like, critical of them, surely they're seeing their own results. And Mike's in the in the kitchen cooking, like, all right, this ain't working. We got to do something different. And surely something happens, like, mid-season now. Like, it's, I feel like now would be, like, a big turning for 100 themes. I think they actually could turn it around. I think, I don't know if they could get to Tokyo. I don't know how down bad they are, like, mentally. It'd be really tough. But if anything, I, I don't know. I, I don't really have much defense here. I know it looks bad. It looks bad, but... <laughs> Trust me, bro. Something that's kind of interesting with both the game that we predicted just before this, the MIBR against Sentinels, and this one, uh, bye bye, Bala, is that it's a bit of a, oh, there you go, you're back again. It's a bit of a trap game for the favorites, both of them. Where when we think about the previous one, MIBR play against Leviathan to start with. And I would imagine quite a lot of their prep work is going to go into that battle because 
Both teams just recently beat NRG. There's actually quite a fight for like those top seeds. It's a really important game. And then both of those teams, Leviathan and MIBR, are going to play against, on paper, I guess, based on their record, weaker teams of 100 Thieves and Sentinels afterwards. I could see that being a bit of a trap that the top teams fall into, perhaps. Not gonna lie, I didn't listen to a word you said. But... <laughs> All good. All good. Never do. Let's move on to the next game. Fuck it. Point, Fuck it, we ball. Fuck it, we ball. Cloud9 versus Furia. Fuck it, we ball. What did I predict? Oh, thank God. <laughs> Mel. <laughs> Mel, what? you're not stuck in my Cloud9 anymore. What? You don't have to know, do this. I know, you don't I know. Have to. Not, Let me Jack, guess. Jack is not forcing you to. You Let can change. Guess. It's time. Cloud9 is one of my favorite teams. I no, 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 okay, okay. That, that one, okay, that one was literally troll. Like, that one was actually <laughs> meme. But this one, I don't know. Okay, I wasn't even a believer in C9. I'll be the first one to say it. I wasn't a believer because everything that happened, I'm like, dude, this is such high expectations. Like, I don't know how these guys are going to perform based on all the, you know, uh, pressure and everything. But they've actually looked pretty good. Like, I, I think the first week, Cloud9 looked really rough. Even though they pulled out a win versus EG, I was not really convinced. I yeah. didn't really... I think they played very well and i think they would tell you the same thing i think both teams would tell you they did not play well that day but c9 happened to make like less mistakes and punish dg but i actually think this is like i think they're riding a momentum wave right now and as good as furia is i think it could be pretty close i'm not, I'm not like 100 percent. i'm not like c9 is definitely going to win this game i think it's pretty coin flip but that's just that's Perfect. my logic there's honestly almost zero logic i just see that how they play and i think that it's going to be consistent and they're going to have a lot of momentum coming into this week I actually think they can think punish a lot of Furious map pool, right? I think that that is an area where Cloud9 can really get, go crazy. I think Cloud9 can definitely pull off a win on split if that's not taken out of the pool. Uh, and I think that there are other places that Cloud9 have been willing to go in that map pool that have been very quickly... They've, they've very quickly come up with some good ideas on different maps that if they have a good idea of where Fury are going to lean towards, uh, they might be able to get two maps in the pool that are winnable here. I could see that happening. Yep. Although if they go for Pearl, then they're <laughs> fine. Because Kilo's gonna one tap them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what are Furious maps where they've just been looking insane? I mean, Ascent would be the Pearl, same kind of thing, right? Ascent and Icebox. Their defense on Ascent is good. Their Icebox and they lost a lot, sure. But like, uh, other than that, their Icebox is legendary. Yeah, but that's three maps. Cloud9 can get rid of two of those. They can probably pick Split off the rip because Fury have a perma ban, right? Furious perma ban has been uh, Lotus, but then they didn't perma it against Loud. They went for, what did they ban in that game? Pearl instead, <laughs> yeah. They um, banned Pearl against Yeah, Loud. they banned Pearl because Fury were playing that weird, like, triple yeah, flash yeah, comp, yeah, yeah. or double flash neon comp, and they just didn't want to play it anymore. So I don't know. I mean, I think if whatever Fury... <sighs> hmm. If Fury leaves Lotus open, Cloud9 have to go there, right? And then <laughs> go towards Split as a decider if they can. Yeah, to bring up your, like, prep narrative you were bringing up, though, I feel like this is, like really tough for C9 because they're like the newest team who I think is still trying to like figure out their map. Well, I think we saw that in their loud series where like they had one map where it was clear they really drilled and really had a lot of time to anti-strat loud. And on the second two, they didn't have that same level of preparation. Yeah. I think they might kind of have a similar situation here because they have two really hard matches in Super Week. They they play energy off the rip. And then like two days later, they have to play Leviathan. That's a lot of prep against two really hard teams that you have to do in a pretty short period of time. And on the other hand for furia i think they have so much they can learn off that loud series and then they get the kind of the the treat of getting to play eg which on paper should be a pretty <laughs> easy one-sided mat uh, match for them and then cloud nine is their second one two days later like that feels like a reasonable amount of prep for a team that i would already say is like on paper favored and whose consistency i think has been better throughout um this league but i also see like i mean i punted c9 on energy i don't think it's insane to punt them here no, I agree. I don't think it's insane. I think it's it's. What's the ball of percentage on this game? Is this like a seventy thirty? Thirty percent, yeah. Thir thirty five, sixty five, maybe. Mm, no, it's a thirty percent. <laughs> so it's the minimum. Yep. Okay, that's that's more confidence than I expected, honestly, from the official ball of percentage. <laughs> okay, this next segment, I'm not saying a word. One second. <laughs> that's a fucking lie. One second, okay. everyone. We have okay. breaking news. What? Breaking, oh, breaking news? news? Yeah, breaking Holy news. Shit. Oh, snap. What's the news? What? New Zera steps down what? from he can't. Wow, he can't! What do you mean? <laughs> what is that even? Where, where's the announcement? Wow. Where's the announcement? What's going on? We're informed earlier this week by our player, New Zera, 
of his wish to step down from our VCT roster. It's important for us to listen to our players. Uh, we respect his decision. Regarding the rules to change players during a split, our assistant coach and official substitute will take his place in the roster starting Friday. Who is this guy? Daish? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, assistant coach. But like, has but he is he like a keyboard assistant coach, or he's, no, he's played, or he's, just a straight up? He's played, but like you, like a long, like beta type, like fish. He played oh, for L'Institut in twenty twenty in like French tier three in twenty twenty. Yeah. Oh, oh boy, what is this? Translate tweet. Wait, who's the who's the tweet? Sorry, this is from Scream. This is from Scream. Scream if oh. you could read it aloud. Uh, here's the reason for my tweet this morning. He's referencing another tweet, though, that I don't understand. So uh, are we able to take a look for what the context might be? Just to begin here? Oh. Oh, is it this one? Ça recommence. It means, uh, yeah. It's starting yeah. again. Oh, right. Okay, okay. So he just posted a bit of a cryptic tweet, and now he's following up like, this is the reason for it. Okay. So this is the reason for my tweet this morning. Um, my brother. My brother and I... Uh, okay, my brother and I uh, still remember the moment when one of our teammates abandoned the team whilst inside a competition, uh, but today we're encountering a lot of difficulties internally. Honestly, I think this is the first time in my career where I need all your support and strength to overcome this ordeal. Playing as a team is such so intense. I wish everyone this happiness. On the other hand, it's enough that a link does not attach to a chain and all is lost. It's like a metaphor, presumably, that, like, uh, don't know. Don't really understand the <laughs> metaphor, but that's just Google Translate's problem. It's shade towards Link, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I read it to that as well. Team Liquid. Right, yeah, that's what that paragraph is about, yeah. <laughs> but I assume he's not, like, the way that I'm reading it is not that he's throwing the same shade towards New Zero. <laughs> no, no, no. But, he's, I mean, maybe, but... He's just the, saying the entire, like, the, the train is not getting derailed. Wait, because one, the, the sub is IGLing. Today Wait, we are going what? to play with my brother, oh, yeah. Zaysh, and it is to him that I delegate the role of leader. For me, it is normal that the coach and assistant coach have control over what? the lead, and I am very happy to be able to count on him. I will finally be able to focus on me and my uh, crosshair. Holy shit. I, I actually like the move. <laughs> we have so much power. We literally I... made this happen. We have no, unlimited <laughs> power. We've just <laughs> talked about this. Definitely did not say they this. should be running their assistant coaches, their IGL. I said anybody. Just bring anybody. <laughs> you did literally say anybody, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, Nuzera has been looking really shoddy for that team. And I just didn't think that they would make a change uh, because the rosters are locked. <laughs> so, but... Hopefully this guy is godlike. Hopefully he's been DMing a little bit. Uh, just a tragic situation for the team to be in, though, genuinely. Yep. What do you even say uh, about that? The it's just thing. It, the assistant coach was clearly a part of, like, the coaching structure that already wasn't working. Like... Yeah, but... Mm, there's, and he there's hasn't a played. Uh, but can it get worse? Probably. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, if he has... If he has any idea of how to execute their ideas when they're in the game, it's probably just going to free up Scream to be a better player. I hope. That, that's going to create something. Do you think I mean, he, maybe this, he'll this tell the... them how much money they need to save into the next round? Like, <laughs> I hope. This, <laughs> this is the first team that's properly just exploded. Every year there's going to be a couple from working the Overwatch League, uh, you know, for a few years. Every year there's one team that just goes and just explodes and is terrible for the rest of the year. And uh, looks like Comic Con won the race to the bottom. I'm I sure there'll it. be other teams that will join them over the course yeah. of the year, genuinely. Dude, that sucks, though. Like, dude, their entire year is just over. Like, <laughs> I feel yeah. so bad for the play. Like, the format this year is brutal. It's... One split, you do bad in the first split, no, no LCQ, it's, it's over for the rest of the year. And you just have to sit and think about what you've done. Like, but it's, you, say, that's brutal. you say that's the format being rougher this year. That's how it's going to work next year as well, except that you get an extra split instead of lock it. Yes. Like, if, the, if they had trolled yes, the both. first split and then not made any roster moves, they would still have ruined their season by April next year. But I think it's a little different with you have more time to fix in a in like a league season, even if it is only like eight or nine weeks compared matches, to a lock in yeah. tournament. Like K Corp played two games at lock in over like three days. Like I, I yeah. think it would have made a difference. But yeah, it's tough either way. It's a brutal format. Yeah, that's uh that's a rough one. I feel like um It's time to yeah, move think, on. Yeah. Power it, rankings. It, 
Yeah, power rankings. Let's uh You're just mad you can't make content anymore, bro. Just No, over. I'll definitely find a way to still make content. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I'm going to dress myself up as Luffy and start cheering for them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, America's, America's Super Week Power Rankings. So, Move lots let's first. fix Get these, the shall we? Get the panther out of there. Get the panther <laughs> out. Put them in second. Do they belong in second? I think that's a really... Like, because we, we were discussing... Whether Leviathan, Loud, Furia, like, we talked about the top three being fairly interchangeable. I think after the Loud win, it's clear that that was not the case. But I think Leviathan and Furia might be interchangeable now. What, does anyone have strong opinions either way? Nope. I, mm, yeah. I mean, Furia's only loss has been to Loud. They beat Leviathan. They should be above Leviathan. They beat Leviathan. Leviathan beat NRG. That solves it. One, two, okay. three, four. Holy shit. It's all coming into place. <laughs> Um, what, are they, what, what are they doing in fifth? We have them in fifth. Get them out of here. Oh, we were on some like actual copium for 100 Thieves. I think 100 Thieves <laughs> 8. I think 100 Thieves 8. <laughs> Why? Because every team looked like they were playing poorly. Remember, if you can cast your mind back, Crew and yeah. MIBR had a really close game. Cloud9 yeah. looked like they were on the rise, but yeah. 100 Thieves and Sentinels had played themselves close, and then had oh, also yeah. 100 Thieves looked like they might be trending better than Sentinels because Sentinels had all of those like yeah. you know problems with how the roster was working. But at the yeah. end of the day, 100 Thieves just looked so bad against Cloud9 that I don't think you can justify them being anywhere near that fifth place. And IBR in fifth. Mm. Oh, see, already though, MIBR beat NRG, right? So. Do you think that was an upset result? Like, would you still stand by that being an upset rather than what you would expect to happen normally? Yes. I would stand by that being an upset. What do you think, Mel? I feel like it shouldn't even ever be that close, to be honest. Ooh. But that's just like my POV, like watching NRG and like being really such a big fan of FNS's calling and how they run their ship. I feel like they, like, you can't really excuse being up like 10 first bloods and like not closing out just fundamentally. Like it's just pure mm. fundamentally. But at the same time, they were really close games. That's why I feel like you could honestly rate. Uh, nah, you couldn't make the argument for something what higher, actually. Never mind. This ordering for one through five is correct, but the tier gap is supposed to be after loud. <laughs> and then I mean, after that's MIBR. kind of real. I, I was actually going to say, what if there's a tier gap between Loud, Fury, Leviathan, and NRG, MIBR? Nah, I fuck with this more than you fuck in with the tier, bro. Okay, do you think that MIBR and. NRG are on the same tier as Loud and uh, Leviathan and Furia. Sorry, Maybe. Say it again. The fourth and fifth that we've got here, are they on the same tier as two and three? Because they, they've only lost to each other. NRG have gone zero and two against Leviathan. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, you think? Well, not, not fully. Like, I don't think it might be ours there. But. But I think that everybody else is together okay all right i think like furia leviathan and energy can all just like trade wins and i think mibr could upset any of those teams so they should belong in the same tier then we shouldn't put a tier break between i think the tier five. break is after five okay so then who would you put at sixth cloud who's nine. the top of the next tier cloud yeah. nine honestly Probably. is cloud nine it, are we I feel is like Cloud9 Cloud a tier gap below MIBR? Right, that's what I was getting to. They're clawing their way up There's the no rankings. Tier gaps. There's no tier gaps. Maybe Bala's correct. Maybe Bala was right all Sheesh. along. Oh, shit. Like I'm saying, like the, the, the reason why I was struggling with MI, the MIBR question was that like MIBR obviously beat NRG, so like they can't be a tier gap below them. That no, doesn't no. make any sense. But Fury and Leviathan are still farther up along that line. It's just... NRG could also beat them. Like we almost right. saw Leviathan lose to NRG. Well, not almost, but no, not really. they struggled I mean, it was a little. Two zero, bit. but yeah, um, it's close first map. Close first map. It. Yeah. So, anyways, that's the argument. It's like the the teams at the bottom can do a little bit more damage to the teams in the middle. The teams at the top might struggle a little bit at the teams at the bottom, but they're mostly going to win, and then they're going to struggle against the teams in the middle. That's why it's like weird in this sense. Right. Because, it, because all these teams are genuinely really close. Like, really yes. close. We've got to put EG in ninth, right? Yes. Sure. They just beat Crew. I thought sure. they would lose to Crew. I really did, but they ended up getting the win. Can we put Sentinels above 100 Thieves? Nah, 
Not without saying. I was just thinking. Not. Well, oh, yes. I mean, yes. you could. Yes, I feel like they no, could have. 100%. Hmm. 100, Sentinels beat 100 Thieves, and 100 Thieves looked so awful in their game against Cloud9, whereas Sentinels just got a, you know, very, very close game against Leviathan. Sentinels might be underrated here, considering how close their game was against Leviathan. Who did they beat? Who did they, who did they beat on here to, to move up? Did they beat Fury? Did they beat NRG? Did they beat MIBR? Like... MIBR would be the big one from Super Week, right? Like, Sentinels literally plays against MIBR, don't they? Yes. But we're also playing with the sub, and we, like, yeah, don't that's, know. And we I all like... predicted them to win. Yeah, yeah. but that's just that's, that's full code from every single one of us. And also... <laughs> all of us thought we were doing something crazy, but we were all simultaneously crazy. <laughs> we're, we're, all just, we're all just too groupthink. That's yeah, the problem. Really Even when we don't tell each other what we're thinking, we still tell what each other are thinking. Problematic. <laughs> The the reason here's here's the reason why Sentinels is still in seventh. I think 100 Thieves looks poor enough that on their own they would stand in eighth out of tenth. Now Sentinels, they probably have a little bit more potential than we're we're putting here, and that's why we're arguing to push them up. But we just haven't seen it, so we have no clue. And I think it's fair without having seen Marv on the team, without having seen Kaplan as head coach, and how that changes things. I think it's fair to undervalue them a little bit based off of what we think their potential might be. Um, I don't really believe there's a tier gap, though, between six and seven, is there? No. No. I they also don't think there's a tier gap between five and six. Put 100 Thieves in their own tier. <laughs> their own tier? No. Sentinels is not in the same tier as Furia, Leviathan, NRG, MIBR. Or even just, let's just narrow down, they're not in the same tier as Furia, Leviathan. I mean, I feel yeah, like they're really close game versus Leviathan outside of third map does a lot of heavy lifting for them, though. If you say, even if them you being say, on the wrong... Even you could say they're having role issues or they don't look nearly as good. They still brought it to almost a 2-0. That's, that, that's what it does a lot of heavy lifting for That's them. what it means to be in the same tier as somebody, to have games that could mm. go either way. Like, that Sentinels game could have been a 2-0 had a couple of rounds been different. That, yeah. Doesn't that mean, literally, that they're in the same tier as them? I guess. it. Oh, it's just... I, I I feel like it's just like with the changes with like a sub I just like can't. Consciously. We're literally <laughs> predicting them to get <sighs> more wins there's, with this. There's no, oh. there's no tier breaks. We're literally changing the tier breaks every single week. It makes no <laughs> sense. Okay, what if the only tier break is between loud and second place, and between hundred thieves and ninth and tenth place? I agree with that. I think the way I that hundred thieves shit better. on EG and the way that loud shit on Furia. Maybe there's not even a tier break between Loud and the rest, to be honest, because the when Loud are not taking the game as seriously, we saw them have like three mappers against some of the others that are more towards the middle. But, but I think I'd be fine it with purely this. off of power, like power. This is power rankings. They showed their true power this week in like playing their real comps, in not experimenting as much, in like actually I think playing to their full potential, and they fucking dumpstered on a team that we thought could possibly be better than them. I think that, if anything, shows that, like, well, everyone else has been, like, trading wins, and sure, Loud has been there in the early days. I think that was just experimentation. It's early days. They were trying new stuff. I think they've figured out their shit now, and it's like they're focused up against the teams they know they can beat. And I think that clearly puts them just a tier above. I'm happy about this, which is how you know it's wrong. Yep. I'm indifferent. That's how you know it's wrong. Well, how do you feel about this? I think I, I like it. I think I feel like I'm gonna look like a fucking idiot after next week, though. Somehow. You somehow, came on Pachat already, so like that's gonna happen regardless. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I just in my brain, like going into this split, I really had hundred these pegged as like the second best NA team, and just seeing this, my brain is like breaking. Like my brain actually breaks. God. I mean, they've only dropped to the third best. I mean, I mean that's just more. that's just how bad the NA teams are doing right now. Is that? <laughs> I say we do have them at four right now. <laughs> oh, sorry, they're the fourth. Sorry, I literally counted incorrectly. <laughs> no, sorry, I literally counted incorrectly. Yeah, so it's gonna be like by leaps and yeah, bounds, though. Bad. I really thought it was gonna be by leaps and bounds after a lot. I thought it was gonna yeah. be like energy hundred thieves gap rest, but this, yeah. this makes me sad to see you. I feel like this is pretty accurate. The, that's that's what then. DDK said in his interview before they just <laughs> lost to Cloud9 as well. It was like NRG 100 Thieves are the most fundamentally sound teams. 
Maybe, I mean, maybe in scrims, but they ain't showing it in matches. All right, well, there's another little power ranking for you all to mold over at home. I'm sure that's already been posted to Reddit and people are getting angry already. Love to see it. Um, all that remains is for the most important segment of the week, a little check-in on Wire. What's, what's he up to? It's a Wire's weekly award. Good stuff. I love that. I love that. Um, wow. the, there is only one worthy winner of Wyatt's Weekly Award this week, and it is uh, Wyatt himself. Um, he's been still doing 100 Thieves analysis despite having a concussion and being in a car accident. So, I mean, if there's if there's anybody grinding Valorant out there that's doing it harder than him, I don't know. I mean, maybe Sliggy. Sliggy's probably got a concussion from watching some of the other games. Hasn't <laughs> <it>? <laughs> that guy's watching, watching Talent and K-Core in the same day. <laughs> He needs yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, w Wyatt, I think, is a very de uh, deserving winner of this one. Um, wishing him an extremely speedy recovery. Um, and like I said, he he's being looked after. So, uh, you know, go and send him a nice message. I think he'd really appreciate that. Um, find, I don't know, a YouTube channel or a tweet or something and tell him how much you appreciate him and tell him he's good at Valorant or something. Yeah, wh wh whatever comes to mind. Because um, I think that would brighten his day up. And, uh, yeah, that, that does it for us over here for episode 130. Mel, thank you very much for coming around. Thank you guys for having Mel. me. can't believe it. I made it on the plat chat. My yes. career is, is made. I'm retired now. All ruined. All ruined? <laughs> See what happens after these uh, predictions you made come out. Oh, yeah, exactly. Dude, what if I have 100% character? You guys don't want to be fucking pissed. Yeah, we, I mean, we'll I mean, have to get you back on for next week if you have 100% correct. Mel is the you... last remaining NA fan. I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you can catch us next week. Uh, leave a comment. Again, if you can't find Wyatt's Twitter or whatever, then leave a comment down here wishing Wyatt well. And that way we'll you know, be able to show it to him uh, later on. Okay. We'll see you for episode 131 after North American Super Week and Pacific's fans will still be molded. So, unlucky. <laughs>